what it should be. This is your boy N O R E. What up? It's DJ E F N. And this is Drink Champs. Yeah, be able to make some noise. Hey. Hey. When 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 we started this show, we wanted we wanted to dedicate the whole show to legends, to pioneers. This man is a, not only a legend, a pioneer, an icon. He is. I didn't even know he was writing songs in the nineties. <laughs> he is stood the test of time. Been out here, and I'm being honest with you. I mean, I had this little process of you know of of of, of googling <laughs> the artists, and I'll tell you, this is probably the funnest Google I've ever been a part of. <laughs> like, I, I gotta ask, because it's so much crazy when you Google them, it's like, some of this shit can't be true. Like, some <laughs> of this can't be, because it's so illustrious. It's so, the man is literally born in, into royalty. Right. Literally. This is, and, 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 and it's a frame uh, that I just found out. It's called Blue Eye Soul. I did not know what that is. <laughs> I did not know what it is, but we're going to learn today. So in case you don't not, didn't know who we talking about, the mother, the one, only wild right motherfucking hey! day. Oh, that's, that's an introduction right there. Thanks, now, thanks. I got to ask this off top. Yes, sir. Wayne Gretzky babysat you? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> well, my dad, you know, my dad um, was a devout Canadian. Of course, of you know, course, He was course. the American Canadian dad. Right. So uh, he, he came up with David Foster, the right. great producer, songwriter, uh -huh. and Wayne Gretzky. Those were his two homies. So I was lucky enough, I was lucky enough when his I was young, homies. David Foster would, I'd get to visit, my dad would take me to the studio because my dad knew I wanted to be a singer when I was seven years uh -huh. old. Uh -huh. so he would take me to the studio to visit David Foster when he was working on on the Natalie Cole Unforgettable album when he was working on I Will Always Love You. The great, uh, my, one of my favorite stories is I come home from school one day and uh, David Foster's sitting at the piano with Kevin Costner and this tall, beautiful black woman, right? And they are working out how to do I Will Always Love You on my dad's piano in the living oh, room. Oh, Whitney. Because David was working uh, on another project right. around the corner at a different studio and he needed a piano in a room to practice the new, this song that Kevin Costner wanted to do for The Bodyguard. So I walked in on that, you know, just coming home from school. My Wayne Gretzky story is even better. He was... Uh, <laughs> he just threw that out there. I just came home to that. <laughs> yeah. No, it grew, it got, it pretty wild uh, growing up. But yeah, right. what, my Wayne Gretzky story, um, my dad took my older brother to Russia for a, a summer vacation, and Wayne was dating Janet and uh, needed a place to stay in L.A. They wanted to hang in L.A., so he stayed at, in my dad's bedroom for like two weeks. I'm going to Joe Torre baseball camp every day in the Valley in Los Angeles. <laughs> so the phone rings about 7.30 in the morning, one morning. I answer the phone, it's Bruce McNall, the owner of the Kings, and he says, can you please wake Wayne up? And I said, no, 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 he's sleeping, I'm not going in there. And he says, I need you to go and wake him up. So I go, I wake Wayne up, I go to Joe Torrey baseball camp, I come home, Wayne's on the podium in Edmonton, uh, saying that he's been traded to the Kings. So I answered the phone <laughs> the oh, day man. that Wayne Gretzky was traded to the Kings, yeah. Wow. That's when he left Canada. Maybe he didn't That's make it. He left. That's when he you left. should have woken him up earlier. Yeah, but uh, my, one, my one cool, fabulous uh, story with him was he took me, I, the first time I'd ever been in a Rolls Royce, he had okay. a white Rolls Royce and he, convertible, and he took me to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a ball shit. Wayne That's Gretzky. a ball shit. I'll never That's forget being in the drive-thru <laughs> with Wayne driving in a convertible Rolls Royce right. in the valley. Right. And uh, yeah, so a lot of stories like that. Thanks to Pop. Shout out to Alan Thick. Yes, yes, that's the So, your, your mother was, um, what, what show she was on? She was on Days of Our Lives. She was on Days of Our Lives. And she was a singer also, also, right? My mom also had a hit with um, an R&B singer named Carl Anderson. She had a number one song in the 80s, um, uh, Friends and Lovers. Wow. So I'll be your friend. Yeah. That's my mom singing with Carl Anderson. So, you know, wow. we, we've been trying to be black for generations. <laughs> <laughs> This ain't brand new. This ain't new. I used to have a joke because my grandfather it was a jazz trumpet player. His uh -huh. father was a jazz trumpet player. So my joke is we've been trying to be black for six generations. Wow. <laughs> no, no, but okay, I can't. Uh, Bobby explaining on um, different strokes. Yeah. Your father wrote that and sang it. That's my That's dad singing. You on wrote different that? strokes. Different strokes it takes. That's my dad singing. Yo. Yo. When I Googled you, I said, this is so amazing. And like, had some of this had to come in at that point? No, no, he hadn't. Actually, uh, he... Uh 
was always a, a writer and, and he wrote the original Wheel of Fortune theme song. And my mom, <laughs> yeah, and my mom sang the facts of life. That's my mom singing the facts of life. That was my next question. That was my yeah. next question. I yeah. publishing checks are oh good for those things. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, I'll, I'll take some champagne. I'm going to some champagne. Well, there, was, there was one funny story where, um, I guess, Merv Griffin, you know, who owned Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> my dad wrote the original theme song. And after a few years, my dad was making bank. And Merv Griffin's like, who's this Canadian dude making all this money? So he rewrote his own theme songs and oh, said so he could own it. Yeah. Wow. A little trick. some noise for that, man. That's just amazing. <laughs> I, I, I'm sitting there reading, hey, and by dope. the way, we do this for uh, for, for um, every artist. And I'm sitting there, and that's my friend over there, Diego. He gets hyped for nothing. <laughs> he gets, and he's over there like, oh shit! <laughs> it just kept reading, it. and we were like, it just kept going, kept going. And I was like, it was like, so how is how was your childhood? Like, if you you shit. <laughs> like I, I want to call it, you a platinum spoon, not a, not a silver spoon, because you had Wayne Gretzky babysitting you. <laughs> well, my dad was just the most friendly, sociable right. person you would ever meet. He loved. He was from a small mining town in northern Canada, ten thousand people. Wow. He dreamed of Hollywood, wow. loved Hollywood. Wow. So, like, I joke because people are like, "Oh, you Hollywood?" I'm like, "I'm as Hollywood as it gets." Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Like, I was yeah. born in the sign. Right, you know right, what I mean? Right, like, right. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, my dad. loved loved it. My mom uh, was a, is a great singer and actress, and so I just grew up in there. But what I really loved about my father was his ability to make friends. Right. And legitimate, long-term friendships that when, when he passed away, the people that showed up for him, even if it was Leo DiCaprio, you know, like... Yeah, like, they was on the show together. That was Leo's it. first job Yo, was growing pains. pains. And Lee, so Leo and I have been homies ever since. We were sitting in the classroom together at 14 years old, you know, so... <laughs> Your homies list is it. <laughs> I'm just saying, like... I was Googling this shit. I was like, I was sitting there like, some of this got to be made up. You know, sometimes you go Google yourself <laughs> and like people would say shit about you. But this is crazy. So, okay. Did you know growing up you you were royalty? Did you know that? No. Well, you feel because you, you, know, you, you seem some, humble. You go you seem somewhere. Humble. You you go. I think because I saw it so young, okay. and my dad handled it right. so well with such class and right. and kindness. You know what I mean? So I just really appreciated the way my father treated people, and I just wanted to emulate that and follow in his footsteps. What, was he like his character in Growing Pains? Because that's what yeah, you're yeah, describing. Very much. Very much. I mean, you know, he was a little more naughty. You know what I mean? He had his run hosting all the pageants and uh, okay. had a little fun with that for a while, right. but. Uh, no, he was just a he was just the most lovable. He was the kind of guy who would golf and play tennis. Like his whole his whole week was worked out from six a.m. till eleven p.m. His, his whole week was planned. He had dinners every night with friends, and somehow right. never paid for a goddamn thing. Damn. <laughs> my, dad, my, dad golfed, my dad golfed three times a week with friends who had memberships. Right. My dad go, uh, my dad would play tennis, you know, with people who, who had the courts and the hookups. So he he found a way to save his money, leave it to his kids, and. And uh, I, I look up to he's my idol forever. Wow. That's, that's dope. That's, that's, let's, let's make some noise for that. Man. That's all we could aspire to be as parents. Yeah. I'm trying to save some money for my children. <laughs> now, now um, I'm always I'm always like um, enthused when we have guests and we ask their drink list. So I, 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 like that's that's like my favorite part yeah. of the whole show. So when I, I ask your peoples and your people said he drinks Doucet, I say, oh, he hood for real. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I, uh, I uh, support Doucet. I'm part of the I'm part of the Doucet family. Oh, uh. They've been uh, obviously I'm 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 with Rock Nation. So, right. Um, uh, Jay Brown and Jay Z uh, right. family, and uh, when I was doing this um, residency in Los Angeles last mm. year, we did about 15 shows in LA at this small restaurant, only like 250 people. The people, mm. 500 oh, after the people pandemic, trying to like get every week. Thing? No, no, this was just last year, just okay. uh, because I wanted to, I wanted to do a real intimate <laughs> show, right. no smoke, no lights, mm. like right in front of people. So right. Doucet sponsored all these shows for us, wow. and we got to have Little Wayne came out and Two Chains, and no. and uh, it was it's, it was been a great run. You got mad. I had records for Lil Wayne. I got like seven records for Lil Wayne, at, yeah. I was like, these niggas got an that's album together. Like this is like a collaboration album. I'm looking. That's how, my boy. How, how, is, how, how, how is that? Like, you know, coming from R&B, you know, world and, and colliding with, with hip hop. Yeah. Um, it's always a special, but when I'm hearing you guys together, it's like it, it doesn't seem forced at all. No, like no. is it is because you and Wayne is friends? We were we were genuine fans of each other before wow. we blew. Like when I heard Go DJ, mm -hmm. I mean you know I mean he was already blowing up, but when I heard Go DJ, I was like this is the next biggest. 
Wow. Artist, period. I told Andre Hurl, and he was like, "You think so?" Wow. I was like, "Trust me, Dre. This right. this is the one." And so, coincidentally, he just reached out to me. He the first song on my debut album, "A Beautiful World," which is the 20 year anniversary of my right. debut Make some album. <laughs> So we are celebrating. And uh, so he heard this song called Oh Shooter on my mm-hmm. debut album. And he just hit me up out of nowhere and was like, yo, I love this record. Can you send me the tracks? you mind if I do something with it? And I was like, sure, I'll send it to you. And he didn't even take any of my parts out. He just rapped in between where I wasn't singing. Wow. And uh, it ended up being on the Carter II album, you know what I mean? Uh, Which so is amazing. So how did you and Pharrell hook up? Well, actually, let me finish a good Lil Wayne story. So the first time that Lil Wayne ever did The Tonight Show and the first time I ever did The Tonight Show, we did it together. The first time either one of us ever performed on the Grammys, we performed together. So we have, we did Time My Hands, Mm. you know, and he did the big New Orleans thing when he did uh, The Year of the Carter Three. So him and I have a real history together. Right. Yeah. I think it's it's a beautiful thing, man. I like hearing y'all together. He's genuine, too. He's the man. I got mad notes. You want? You want? I want to go back to the relationship with Andre Harrell. Yes. Yeah. A lot there. How did That's you guys well. connect, and, and what was that relationship well, like? Well, um, he was moving to LA to start a, a record label with Babyface, mm-hmm. and uh, they were looking for songs for these couple artists that they had signed or were interested in signing. So. Dre had, there was this artist who was kind of more of a dancer from Miami, like a more dancer first, right. singer second, you know. And so Dre comes to my house with Pete Farmer, a, very, a veteran A&R man from Arista. And uh, Dre comes in and I play a couple songs. And he's like, that's cool, but but the way you sing them. He's like, I like the way you sing in these songs. Because you, you were singing You were selling them to write, 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 write for his other artists. Okay. And right. he was like, but I like the way you sing. He says, you got in your own, you got you got in your own songs, like for right. your own album. And, I, and the funniest thing was just uh, the way the world works. I had just devoted myself to making my debut album, to actually creating, I was about what, 20 years old, you know, when I met him. Um, or no, a little older, like 22, 23. And so I was just started A Beautiful World and I had the first two songs that I was going to put on the album. I sang those two songs for him and he, he didn't want to work with the other artist anymore. He was like, fuck that, I'm hanging with you, we're doing this. And he, he lifted me into his New York City Puff Daddy Naomi Campbell world. I remember I had a Halloween party before my album came out. Mariah's dancing on the dance floor. Naomi's there. Seal is there. Paul Thomas Anderson, the, the award-winning director, and Ted Demi. Um, these were these are the people just hanging out on my balcony because they were friends with Andre. Ted Demi, the and director, yeah, the moment. director. And and they're in the studio. They're all sitting there listening to my album before it comes out. Naomi's in there. Mariah was in there for a while, but couldn't handle the smoke right. and had to walk out. Right. <laughs> She's like, it's too smoky in here. Mm. She was wearing a, a Wonder Woman costume with pom-poms, I don't know, it was some kind of combination. <laughs> but, uh, so this is me at 25 years old before I even had an album out. That's well, what that's what man. being with Andre Harrell was like. <laughs> and because um, I also read somewhere that you, you wrote for, for Brandy. My first uh, a cut that I ever had published was Brandy was 14 and I was 16. And I wrote, and, uh, I wrote a song for her on her debut album. But how, how, did, how, did, how did they start knowing that you you know you know how to Brian write. Brian McKnight actually what happened Brian was McKnight. I did a wow. demo. Another great story. They used to call me Brian McKnight. Barbie Barbie cut you off, but you so, notice every line he said is, is is a bar. Every, <laughs> okay, Brian McKnight. So yeah, I call him Brian McWhite. Oh, I got, Brian, McWhite. Okay. Brian McWhite. So I got another one. So I was in a singing group. We were called As One. It was me and three black guys. And one of the black guys, his godfather was uh, Al Jarreau. So I go to my father at 13 years old, and I go, Dad, we need $1,000 to cut a demo. My dad goes, no, 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 we're not starting that. You're too young. I'm not not spending $1,000 on a demo. And so we went to Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau put the $1,000 down, paid for my first demo. I got to sing three songs Mm. on a mic in some kind of R&B hip-hop fashion. Those three songs got heard by Brian McKnight. Mm -hmm. And, oh, no, 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 there's one more step. Oh, I got got more bars. There's one more step. (laughs) No, no. Those records were heard by Tricky Stewart, wow. who is a young 17-year-old producer out of Chicago who had just moved to Los Angeles with his cousin and, and brother to uh, start building their uh, uh, song basis. So we're in the studio working with the Braxton sisters, wow, right. <laughs> and Brian McKnight is in the studio next door. Right. So I start writing songs and cutting songs with Tricky Stewart. I'm like 15, 14, 15 and what Brian an end, hears, so young though. Yeah, leaving the leaving. Leave, I would uh, ditch school every day at around one o'clock. I'd have my friends pick me up. My my dad didn't know. I got kicked out of school later that year because I was going to the studio every day at fourteen right. years old. But Brian ended up hearing 
that demo and then signed me to a record deal at Interscope Records when I was 16 wow. with Jimmy Iovine. Wow. When I first heard of you... Can I have an ashtray, please? Yes. And a light? When I first heard of you... Um, yeah, a light right here. Yeah, I smoke with you. Um, I thought it was Pharrell. Oh. But before I get to the Pharrell thing, yeah. I wanted to say something that you said something earlier. Did you say Wayne Gretzky was dating Janet Jackson? No, no, Janet uh, Janet Gretzky, who became Janet Gretzky. Oh, okay, all right, no, cool. cool. That, now, that that was, was, that, now, that, now, that would have been a story. <laughs> no, and that was during it, the yeah. Janet days. That yeah. was like, she went to all the hockey games. <laughs> that was like, that's the way love goes, Eric. You know what I mean? <laughs> No, I was thinking because I'm like I'm, I'm thinking for the fans, and the fans was like, "Wait a minute!" He just said, Did he say Wayne, Janet without Wayne getting a last yes, name." Yes, yes, yes. So I had to, I had to make sure, I was like, keep my skills sharp. You know what I mean? That makes um, that yeah. makes sense. Okay, all right. So again, when I first heard of you, I th- heard of you through Pharrell. Then I hit the head is Brian McKnight story, hit yeah. the Andre Harrell story. How did you and Pharrell initially um, uh, get together in, in the first place? Well, Jimmy Iovine. Ooh. It was always the king at that. Yo, I ain't like, Jimmy lie. knew the name drops. It's just keep getting get better and Jimmy, better. <laughs> I, I mean, the best story about Jimmy was Jimmy uh, signed me. I remember the first time I met Jimmy Ivey, and I was in the room with John McClain. John McClain was actually the one who signed me and uh, who runs Michael Jackson's you yeah. know accounts and stuff like that. One of the great A and R's of all time. So John McClain was um, Jimmy's right hand man, and John. Loved my voice. He took me to the record store and bought me Marvin Gaye albums right. and blah, blah, blah. So you need to listen to these guys for ad libs. You should practice right. it. And now I'm 15, 16 years old. Right. You know? I remember the first time I meet Jimmy. I'm in the office with John McClain. Jimmy walks in. He goes, John, we're going to the Laker game tonight. I got courtside seats. I go, hey, I'd love to go with you guys. I want courtside seats. He goes, you can make a hit record first. And then, uh, <laughs> then you, know, you just come sit on the court with me. <laughs> Sounds about right. So, uh, so cut to... Uh, pretty much nine years later, because the, the the records I made with Brian, they were good, but right. they weren't great. You know, they were right. like a B album, and I didn't hadn't quite uh, formulated an image yet. There really wasn't there besides a, a young white kid with a good voice singing R and B music. Right. So they said, "We'll put it out, but we're not going to really spend any money on promotion." I was like, "You know, what, just shelf it, and I'll come back with something better later on." Right. Right. So literally four or five years later, I come back with long hair, Andre Harrell, baby face, and a whole new style of music. And Jimmy and I had when I get you alone when I came to the meeting and Jimmy goes, didn't I sign you like eight years ago? I don't already have you signed you. Like, what do you mean? I got to sign you again. <laughs> wait up, wait up. And, and that didn't. Whoa. And then, oh, so, so the first album was made with Andre. Um, Face was more of a friend. He, but it was that album was all Andre. Like, uh, you know, my musical and artistic development all came from Andre and my confidence. Like, I had never met anybody who also believed in me, maybe even more than I believed in myself, who saw me bigger than I saw myself, because Andre saw the whole thing. He saw the fashion, right. the, the tequila. Right. He saw the future of everything for all right. of us, you know? Right. And sometimes we didn't even think as big as he did, and that was the genius of Andre. Okay. Rest in peace, Andre. Yeah, rest, rest, rest in peace, peace, Andre. We love you, miss you. Um, but yeah, but how did, how did you get with Pharrell? How did so Pharrell- then Pharrell, so after the first album, Jimmy's like, we got this super talent, okay. and um, but he, he didn't connect. He, you know, we didn't right. find a way to sell records yet. Right. So he says, I want you to meet with Pharrell. So I go in the studio with Pharrell. Luckily, <laughs> knock on wood, luckily I had Lost Without You mm-hmm. in the meeting. So I show up to the meeting to meet Pharrell for the first time. Now, we had met like at parties. And he knew of my first album, uh, so did Jay-Z. Like, I knew all these guys, and we'd hang out at parties, and there was a respect. But I hadn't had a hit yet. So I go in, and I, didn't need, I hadn't even recorded the vocal yet. So I sing Lost Without You live mm. in Jimmy Iovine's office for Pharrell the first time he hears it. Obviously, right, I was signed to Star Trek, you know, got the next day. Wow. <laughs> and ever since then, Pharrell has done nothing but bless me with his genius. Do you think having famous parents helped you along the way? I think it helps you uh, young because you see an example of success. You see right. that it's possible, so you believe it's possible for you too. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's just like yeah. anything in any family. If your dad's a good lawyer, or your dad's a good doctor, or your mom does it, you can go, well, then I can do it too. Right. Dad can do it, I can do it. You know. Right. So it does breed confidence, right. but then you hit the reality of... I'm people talented. judging yeah, you. Yeah, like a stigma against you. The stigma, you. Right, right? right. And and then, so yeah, that affected me at a younger age. Now, in hindsight, I realized that's what you have to earn as an artist. You have to earn your own individuality and your own impression that you bypass or, or at least uh, parallel yourself to your parents' accomplishments. Did you feel that anybody ever treated you as a novelty in that moment? Like, oh. I feel like when, when Andre, because Andre had respect from everybody he played music for. So when Andre first started playing my music for people, 
there uh, there was a there, people listened, you know. And I remember when Rolling when he played some of it for somebody at a, either Rolling Stone or one of those uh, popular magazines, and they were like, "They think you sound like Maxwell." And I was like, "Is this, this a bad thing?" Right, right. <laughs> wrong with that? I like the guy just sold four million records, <laughs> but and he's good. Sold out the forum. <laughs> What's wrong with sounding a little like Maxwell? <laughs> because like I, um, I, I one of the do, dope new rappers uh, out is a guy named Russ, right? Mm -hmm. And Russ, I see he receives a lot of slack because they say that his father was so powerful in the industry that they they almost gave the props to his father. As a, and that's just we're we're always trying to knock one peg out right. from people, you know what right. I mean, and take right. something away from their own accomplishments. And mm -hmm. the truth is, is that it does help to have a leg up. It does help to have connections. It does help to have some financial. But my dad didn't give me the first grant. Right. I didn't get the first thousand dollars. That might have been the best thing he did for you, though. And it might have been the best thing he ever did right. for me. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. That's what we all like. I'm balancing my son. My 13 year old son has an incredible voice. He's a natural singer, and he's way more comfortable being on stage than I was until I was 30. Wow. I was a studio rat. Right. I literally lived in the studio 12 right. hours a day until I released the first album and then I started performing. Right. So I didn't become a good performer until, you know, maybe 10 years later, you right. know. So I think with my son, I, I, I want to balance the support, 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 but you're going to have to go write your own songs, go play right. your own guitar. Right. You're going to have to make your own bones, you know. Did you have, you ever had a regular day? <laughs> I do now. I do now. My life, you know, and happily, happily, I have four kids. I have a five-year-old daughter, Mia, a four-year-old daughter, Lola, and a two-year-old son, and they run my world. You know, I mean, my 13-year-old goes back and forth between my and Paula, my uh, ex. But my, uh, my kids are everything. And I think my dad was such a great dad, and I adored him so much. But he was so busy right. during my, like, 10 to 18 era. And he was gone on the weekends, earning because he was he was making he was most every, money. He was everyone's dad. He was, dad. Ev yeah. he, was, he, was, he was everyone's and dad. And he didn't really turn down a job. He just hosted everything, you know. Now he, that you said, I remember as a kid seeing everywhere. him host all those things. You, you didn't even realize because I didn't know that was work back then. Right. Yeah. I just thought that, right. was, that was having fun. So that's crazy. Yeah. No. So so the, you I literally think, had to share your father with with the world. And I think a little bit of that time that I missed, I I want to make sure I don't miss with my kids. Right. You know. Right. But my dad, he set the whole family up. He gave us a, a bar, a standard, you know, right. to live up to. Hell that's yeah. I, I feel like I knew him my whole life. I'm 45 years old. I feel like I knew your dad my whole life. You know the best thing? There isn't a set or a a, a show I can go on or any group right. of of. Uh, backstage people that I work with, if somebody doesn't come up and say how much they love, they worked with my dad of and course. love working. You know what I mean? And that's, yeah. that's the legacy. That's a, yeah, that's a great legacy. I, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm tell you something. I can no longer watch movies because of how much I know about how film works. Yeah. It like kind of ruins it for me. Like I, I kind of like, the other day, I revisited Seinfeld and I realized Seinfeld didn't shoot not one episode in New York City. Whoa. The whole That's shit was crazy. Los Angeles. What did you think of that? Even for the exterior. Even the exteriors? Right. Yes, you're right. Every, it was on set. It's, no, it was yeah. a set. Yeah. But the, and they were showing. And so I'm watching Seinfeld. This is a show that I, I loved back then. Yeah. I still love now. But I'm watching it now. Now that I know the difference, I feel like it took away from everything. Just The magic. Yeah, because you're so much in, involved in entertainment. Mm -hmm. Does entertainment bore you now? No, I think that um, I think I bore myself, <laughs> and I think I have to. Sometimes I think I I uh, like to live in the challenges of life and the struggles, so I can create something that actually is meaningful to me. If life is too easy, if I don't, if I just go, oh, it's all flowers and everybody's happy, then I'm just going to write flowers and happy songs. That's right. not who I am. I'm a soul man. Right. I have to feel the soul of my experience so I can put that soul back into my music. Right. God damn it, man. Where's some flowers at, man? We, Let's go. Let's, come on. Let's come on, baby. God damn it. Because our show is literally about giving people their flowers. They you. literally want to give you your oh, flowers. Man, I would Snoop love Dogg that. said it's like a Grammy coming from the people. God damn it. God, God damn it. Right. What up, nigga? It's like the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank this you. You know what? The older, I heard a great quote from Bob Dylan once. He said something like, uh, it's always nice to be uh, honored while you're still alive. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And the older we get, all these little 
uh, moments of appreciation or flowers or gratitude, you know, mm. because uh, it, we, we're so much more grateful now right. for everything that we've accomplished and right. been a part of. The, right. During the ride, you're just going, it ain't enough. I need another. I need more. Right. Right. And sure, we, I want more, uh, more great music, you right. know, and I want more great friendships, mm. but... But I try not to be so hard on myself anymore, you know? Okay. Right. And appreciate all the people that you've actually touched on the way. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's good to get out. Because sometimes the artists, the older you get, you just end up staying inside with your friends and your circle and your family. And you don't even feel that love anymore. Right. And you start thinking it's not out there. Yep. And then I go out and I, and I see all the smiles and the faces and the handshakes wow. and the people that want to say, I love you. Yeah. And if I'm staying in my house all day, I'll never get to feel that love, you know? It's probably one of the deepest shit I've ever heard just now. Like that shit makes so much sense to me. I don't I know you just I know you're talking to the world, but that moment you were talking to me. Yeah. That shit that shit is Cause, crazy. Because you and I have both experienced yeah. similar parts of the adventure, you, you know? You, you know what's crazy? I noticed that if I if I'm you, you know have you ever woke up and you you, you feel like you're having a bad day? Like right. you, you just yeah. feel it just from the moment you wake up. I literally can't go outside. Because if I go outside, someone's gonna be like, "Hey, Nori, can I take a picture?" And I'm saying I got a yeah. fucked up day. They don't give a fuck about right. my fucking no, day. They're thinking about that song. <laughs> they're thinking about that stuff. That music right. they love yeah. yours. They're thinking yeah. about how you, be on all how the you time. made them feel good. Yep. Right. So speaking of that, that's the one thing I, 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 I hear about the music is, you, you, it seems like you're a feel good person. Like you want to feel good, except for when you, you you tried to get your wife back. You was hurt. You was hurt. Yeah. Well, I was, was confused. Hurt. He was confused. No, yeah. I was confused because because I knew that we weren't supposed to be together anymore. But I that I had just had a child, mm -hmm. and the last thing I wanted to do was spend half of my life with, mm. away from my child. Mm -hmm. The next eighteen years, only seeing him three and a half days a week. That's real. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a single thing you wouldn't try. So that album was the most jumbled and confused album because it, that was the most jumbled and confused part of my. Life, so I I said everything I was going through. So one day I wanted to get her back. The next day I knew it was over. You know, one day right. I wanted to make it work. The next day I knew there was no chance. So that period oh, was that, that your is, therapy though? Making yeah. That? Oh yeah, music right. has always been my diary, my therapy. It's and sometimes I guess that time it didn't work. You know, right, right. it didn't work. Uh, well, it might uh, not have worked externally, no, but, but maybe internally. But then, and then these are the and I'm gonna drop. I'm gonna drop. <laughs> and then these are the beautiful moments. So I'm at I'm at a birthday a, a big birthday party. All these people that I haven't seen this this person in a long time. Time. But uh, his daughter Zoe had been in the studio with me while I was making the Paula album. She had come to visit, right? So Lenny Kravitz is sitting there and he goes, Yo, Zoe told me about the album because she heard it in the studio. And I listened to it and I thought it was amazing. So right there, right. Here I, here's another peer of mine that I love and Lenny, respect. Lenny motherfucking and Kravitz. Lenny yeah. motherfucking Kravitz. Let me get a, let me get a blunt. Thinking, let me get a blunt. And he's telling me when I, when I sold, barely sold anything right. and everybody told me it was a big mistake and he's saying I thought it was amazing. I thought it was beautiful. Right. Or said something right. to the respect of I really respected what you did on that album. Right. And that's what we do as artists. We hit, we miss, but we have to try and share and tell our story. Right. And my story at that time was all over the place. Right. Nah, I mean, I, that, when I was listening, I was like, well, okay, I see, I see what's gonna happen. But you tried. You tried to get it back. You made a whole no, album. No, I, I tried to sell Oh, the idea. The, the idea of okay. getting her back. But I wasn't actually working on getting her back at the time. And that's why, Ooh. because we were already done. Ooh. You we wanted your done. family together. You wanted to I wrote the songs in real son. time. I wrote the whole album in, right. in maybe two months, you know. But I knew we weren't going to be back together. And that was okay. Right. You know, I heard this great quote recently by Jay Shetty. And you guys ever know this guy? Jay Shetty does a lot of inspirational stuff. And he said, people think that growing apart is a bad thing. But you're still growing. Just because you grew apart doesn't mean you didn't grow. Right. And that really touched me deep because I was like, you know what? That's what happened. We were both, her career is taken off. She's got her own life, her own career. My career is taken off. I got my own thing. We've got a baby. We're both changing and growing. But the problem is we grew apart. And that's just something you have to respect instead of take as an L. It's wow. not necessarily an L. Wow. You did, know what I mean? Did Meghan Markle... Write your wedding invitations? Yes. And Meghan Markle wrote our wedding invitations in calligraphy. Yo, what kind of fucking life is she got a, She was a calligraphy, <laughs> she's a calligraphy uh, expert. And <laughs> somehow when she was doing an interview, getting married, she said uh, that she did our uh, wedding invitations. That's the kind of shit that happens in Hollywood. <laughs> Yo, Megan fucking was just, she's married, she's literally married to you. And, and she happened to do your wedding invitations. How the fuck is that? Man, that's Hollywood. That's why I always just say everyone's it Hollywood. Hey, that's man, it's Hollywood. Anything's possible. <laughs> wow. You know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> Anything. Um, speaking of that, 
you know, growing up in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And um, like I see, I see how you kept saying the valley. And you notice none of us was knowing what the fuck he was talking about because most, I, 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 mean, right, when I, I say the valley, it's an LA I, thing. Yes, yeah, LA yeah, thing. LA Everyone is, else, I, I looked at my, yeah, I looked at my Harlan's friends. Like, Harlan's like, where's my, the valley? Is yeah. that in Denver? I looked at a couple, a couple of my <laughs> friends and they looked. But like, it's it's actually it's actually one of the toughest towns to be in, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's almost like everyone's a fucking star in, mm-hmm. in California. It's it's uh, the person bringing you your burger. Yeah. Was on Martin in, right. eight, in 1989, and he's just out there living. It's just like it's just like that. Yeah. Is that something that you're adapted to? You're, you're just used to, or I don't. I think everything has its pluses and minuses. You know, right. I think people in Hollywood they tend to think that they're um, this close to stardom, and the mm-hmm. fact is, a few of them are. Right. right. <laughs> it really is. You know. So I have, I've seen it happen. I've literally seen somebody. A, a month earlier and then the next month they're on the cover of Time Magazine and nobody knows. I mean, it's like it's, things like this really do happen and I've been lucky enough to to see so many journeys realize their potential. So I do believe even when I see my kids I don't tell them this is not possible. Anything is possible. I've seen it happen. I've made the impossible possible. You know, so how, I mean? do you, how do you prepare them for the rougher side of that? Because the percentages are against most. Well I, I, I don't encourage any of them to get into entertainment business. I encourage them to have craft right to build craft something you love to do if you do it long enough and you build a craft at it you will succeed you will find a place you can't just want to be a star you want to be a star good luck you know what i mean but you want to have craft and if you earn the hours that it takes to learn a craft i spent 12 hours in the studio every day by the time i was from 16 to 20 you know what I mean? So by the time I was 20, by the time I was 22, I had written and produced two dozen Golden Platinum records. Before I'd ever released one of my own songs, I had already had two dozen Golden Platinum albums. You know, I was on Mark Anthony. I wrote Mark Anthony's. Uh, yeah, you got to look for, for salsa, Christina right? For, Hagen, for like, no, no, the funny thing was, uh, I, was, I had this lucky streak in my late teen years, in my early 20s, where I happened to be on everybody's biggest album. I, I, the song that I wrote for Usher, Confessions. The song I wrote for Christina was her debut album, her biggest album. The song I wrote for Mark Anthony, his biggest selling American album. The song I wrote for Maya, it was her platinum album. So I had this incredible, le- Pink, right, Pink's Pink. biggest album ah. was her first album. All of my notes. All so my notes. so the, this was literally, by, and you know, by the time I was 22 years years old I, I just amassed a, a, a who's great helping you get those placements because that's uh, difficult publishers you have a publishing company luckily I signed a publishing deal when I was about 16 17 and she would pitch me to all these artists and they'd come by our studio and we'd write a song for them and wow. and then just get lucky to be on a, <laughs> on a I never had the hit right. I never had the hit always had a cut album on cut. the biggest album right. yeah Oh, that's all you need. Hey, man. <laughs> we ready for a quick time slam? Let's go. <clears throat> you guys mind if I do a quick uh, cigarette break? Yeah, okay. 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 All right, we're going to give you two options. You okay. pick one, and we don't drink. But if you say both or neither... So you be politically correct. If you're the poli- if you give the politically correct answer, we're yeah. all drinking. Okay. But we, say, we, we, we don't I leave you by yourself. No, and we, we drink with you. Probably we drink with you. But if you, you pick one, nobody drinks, and feel free to give us a story or anything that comes yes. to mind okay. from yeah. any of these two things we tell you. Yeah. Okay. You want to start? Or you want me to start? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You just start. All right. Usher or Chris Brown? Oh uh, well, I, uh, artistically, I love both, but but I'm gonna have to pick my man Usher just because okay. we go back 20. years. You got a Grammy together too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, that's my boy. Okay, 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 okay fair enough. Okay. Like we 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 go to each other's kids' birthday parties and stuff. Yeah, gotta pick. Okay. See, Breezy don't text me back sometimes. I'll be sending him fun <laughs> videos. <laughs> I was sending him fuck me. We hung out recently and had a blast together. But but I uh, I sent him a video because my my girl and her friends love Chris Brown. Like when it's when it's girls' night, it just starts with these hoes ain't loyal. You know. What I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> so wasn't ready. <laughs> so so I be texting him from the party bus on the birthday night, uh, <laughs> giving him one of these. You know. What I mean? uh, Sometimes he hits back. <laughs> so 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 what is it? Re re seen. How do you mean? Like, 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 um. No, I would just be like, yo, party in your jams tonight. You know what I mean? Oh, Stuff okay. Like that. I, I, thought you, I, I, I like thought to, you... I like to send uh, videos to my friends when we're partying to their music. That's I, thought, dope. I thought you meant like, you know, you, you know, when oh, you text him back. Usher answered. So that, that's why I'm gonna pick Usher. Usher answered. Face time. <laughs> that's Usher a deciding answered the deciding time in the party bus. <laughs> Usher FaceTimed with us while we were listening to Daddy's Home. <laughs> okay. Right. By the way, I don't want to ask this one. You can. I got you. Nas or Jada Kiss? 
Oh, well, I got records with both. Um, that's another drop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was, I was letting you go. I didn't no, no. I want you to stop. I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how you can pick between those. We drinking? Yeah. So we're drinking. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Cheers, Shot. cheers. Shot. Shot. Salud. Thank cheers. you. Salud. Bless. So we, yeah, do, yeah, we do a little Let's shots because the game yeah, is a little yeah, yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and. Mm. I, got, I got shit to do today. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Thank Drink you. Drink tips. I'm fucking with you. I'm fucking with you. Okay, this is a good one. Marvin Gaye or Stevie Wonder? Oh, well, uh, that's that's a both. You, you guys are gonna we're gonna be drunk yeah, soon. I mean. Because first of all, there's nothing that you can't learn from either one of those catalogs and 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 artists and heart. What I love, that Andre Andre Harrell always knew that those were my two favorites because they sang about love, that's right. and that's that's my core uh, has always been to sing about love or to to sing about trying to make love better. Okay, you know take your shot. You have to love that shot. You. Yeah, I'm a little, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Stevie and Marvin. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for both being amazing. And by the way, we got that uka, just in case you know. That's that, the best. Uh, I'm good, I'm planning uh, a nap after this. Yeah, yeah, I'm the best on the planet. Motherfucker uka, make some noise. Hey! Yeah, got Diego, Diego over there smoking it down. Go, God, God damn it. Oh, Yo, it is good. It is good. It is good. Mm. <laughs> and that, that never hurt nobody. All right, you ready? Yeah. Joe to see your Black Street. Oh, uh, once again, Teddy, that's Andre Harrell family. So, Teddy, I have a record with Teddy. We did Sex in the Morning together with Snoop, with Snoop Dogg on it. I love Teddy. Uh, but Jodeci... Jodeci off the chain. Uh, Jodeci taught me so much vocally. Like, I worshipped KC and JoJo. And, as, a know, listener, you know, as a listener, as a listener. As a listener, as just the songs, the production. Like, right. that era, I was 13. I, think, I don't think anybody influenced me more as a teenager than Jodeci, wow. vocally and musically. Like that was, yeah. I, I sing Come and Talk to Me in acapella in my show, you know what I mean? Like, great record, and the remix even better. And, and yeah, and you know, what's, you know what's so great about, and I know you experienced this too, mm -hmm. um, growing up idolizing these artists, and then here I am, and him and, him and I have been texting about doing a song together. He's right. like, yo, I need a song, like, what was the last thing you said to me? I need a song like, um, Oh, I'm forgetting the artist. Who's this texting you, Casey? Let's see now. This this shit is catching up to me now. Now I can't remember my favorite artist. <laughs> no, Casey and I have been texting. Yeah, because you know when Andre passed and just all, all the all of the disciples of Andre. Right. You know what right. I mean? We all uh, have stayed in touch and become friends. And um, and yeah, so Casey and I have been talking about doing a song together. I can't remember the artist right now. That you got That'd me be drinking incredible. tequila. Okay, so we you picked Jodeci. I definitely picked Jodeci picked, on that one, okay. so I don't have to okay. drink. Yes, you don't have to drink. <laughs> But shout out to Teddy and Blackstreet. <laughs> shout out to Teddy. Biggie or Big L? Uh, definitely Biggie for me. Okay. Yeah. Little Wayne or Drake? I gotta pick Weezy. Gotta pick Weezy. I should take a shot for you for me knowing that no, you're gonna pick I Weezy. Got, gotta <laughs> pick Weezy. <laughs> and you know, I mean, Drizzy. I'm literally we're in the car every week for for the last 15 years to Drizzy. So, right. but uh, but yeah, there's something about Wayne. There's something about Wayne. I feel that that just has never existed and will never exist. Like, right. it's just such an individual, lyrical, vocal perspective that he brings, you know? And he's a cool dude, too. Like, yeah, real very cool dude. But your father was like, the first king of Canada, and then Drake is like the king of Canada. Now. <laughs> Drake is, is, is the king is of Canada. Canada. Drake's the king of Saint Tropez. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. God damn it. God damn it, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> Brian McKnight or Keith Sweat? Got to go with McKnight, because, yeah, that was my... Uh, um, Keith, those records that Keith... I remember I was... Uh, that was what was so great about... Remember I told you about Al Jarreau's yes. God? His mm -hmm. uh, name is uh, Tabiso and Kerianye, and he's become a very successful uh, A&R and publisher himself. Mm -hmm. um, and he was my first Andre Harrell. When I was, like, 14... Mm -hmm. Oh, here's another good story. Well, so, yeah. so I'm 14 years old... And I'm hanging out with my, the other guys in my singing group were 19 and 20 years old, right? They had a hookup at the Palladium in LA. So they decided to take me to the Palladium. It's a boys to men, Joe to C, and I believe ABC. Mm. Like, yeah. let's go back. Yep. Kind of night, right? I'm 14 years old. 
Um, I'm literally walking around. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's right. They they had the hook at the Palladium. I don't even know how I got there. I was just with my older Hollywood, like David Faustino, Brian Austin Green, white boy friends, right? Yeah. That's who it was. I was with the white boys. I was with the white boy crew. <laughs> was the white boy. I was with the white boy crew. <laughs> I was with the white boy young TV crew, the 90210 crew. And so Brian Austin Green and them, they loved hip hop, right? Yeah, they were all, they, they were all these yeah. hip hop heads. And we, I was the same way. We Somehow we, we had become friends. Uh, through my dad taking me to young Hollywood parties, right. whatever. So they took me. So they're all like 19, 20 years old. I'm 14. And and uh, they end up somewhere else. I end up wandering through the party, and I find myself uh, seeing these three black guys, well-dressed, kind of sitting there. And I walk, I don't even know how this happens. I just kind of walk up, and I go, hey, what's, what's your name? What you guys doing? Do you guys, you guys sing? And they said, yeah, we sing. I don't know how I had that feeling. And I said, yeah, I sing too. I sang for them right there in the, in the Palladium at the table on the spot, made friends. We ended up starting a singing group together, uh-huh. and that ended up, uh, and this guy, Tabiso, ended up teaching me about the culture of black music and about A&R and mm. about how to get a record deal. So when I, we, he took me to Warner Brothers Records, and the first two songs I sang to get a record deal were Jodeci's Gotta Love wow. and uh, Commission's um, um, Running Back to You. At a 14-year-old white boy. Man, you chose some cuts, too. <laughs> How about the acts, man? You ain't never listened to the Beach Boys? Like, <laughs> no, I, you know, I think we all, like, I, maybe I wanted to, to j- I love black music and black right. culture so much naturally. Michael Jordan, Eddie Murphy, like that whole era right. as a white boy. I remember listening to N.W.A. with my headphones and my Walkman right. in the kitchen, and my mom doesn't know I'm listening to a bitch, you know, a bitch is a bitch or right. something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, mom, if you knew what I'm listening to. I was so obsessed with the whole thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's always just just felt like like that was where I belonged. That culture is where I belonged. You know, right. that, that's beautiful. Let me, like, I, and I know we still on quick time with slime, but how come like you know there's people who who are obviously white that make uh, black music and they're, they're, they're and sometimes they call them a culture vulture. Mm-hmm. What do you feel about that word, a culture vulture? Like, what do you think? I think that that you know if you're using something. Um, then you're just using it. Right. If you love something, right. if it's in your soul, if it's in your blood, if you if you I like walk it. it daily and you treat every person that's a part of that movement and culture with the same respect and dignity they deserve, I like then that. you don't have to answer to nobody. I like that. I like that. That was hard. All right, go ahead. Yeah, Finn, you want to go to the next one? Growing pains or different strokes? I mean, I think... <laughs> I think Gotta we kind of GP. GP. Love you, Pop. He went gigs on us. Yeah. Trey songs of Jeremiah. Mm. I'm gonna go Jeremiah. Mm. I like that 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 record he did with Fifty. Mm. Okay. Me and Carlos Sticky. And you got you, <laughs> and you, you got a song with Trey songs too, right? Do I? Yeah, you got a song so. with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, it's funny. I totally forgot I was on, like, this is this is what happens when you, you know, drink too much tequila. Uh-huh. You, uh, I remember, I, I, did, I totally forgot that I was on the Quincy Jones redo of, like, PYT, that I did this whole vocal and T-Pain's on it. <laughs> oh, shit. Because <laughs> like, I, I think what happens is you get into a, a place, like, where Blurred Lines in that, that year or right. those couple years, mm. and you're just doing it stuff. literally you're getting calls lines. for everything. <laughs> right. And, of course, if Quincy Jones calls and wants you to drop a verse, yeah, you yeah. just do it. No matter what it is. Six years later, totally forgot I'd ever done that record. Wow. That's the, that's, that's the beauty of the business. Okay. Podcast or radio? You know, I haven't gotten totally into the podcast thing yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, my girl loves it. I think it's it's my uh, impatience. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I don't think for it's easy form. for me to sit down and do long form. Like I don't. I don't like watching series. I like movies. Right. <laughs> I have a tough time. I like when it, when I'm into a series and the the new episode drops once a week. Right. So there's a separation and anticipation, yeah. and I only watch for an hour or, or right, plus. Right. But me trying to sit there and watch uh, like ten episodes in a row. Right. Oh, oh no, way, man. Yeah. No, I gotta go write yeah, a song. Yeah, no, I'm a bitch watcher. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go do something. I'm a bitch. So you're in radio. I'm, I'm, well, I mean, yeah, I, I'm an old. I'm old. No. Cool. No I'm thinking radio. Okay. I am. You know, I'm not answering this, brother. <laughs> Rihanna or Beyonce? Oh, both. 
Ain't no answer to that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Missy or Eve? Ooh. Oh, well, I got to pick Missy. Just, I mean, Eve, I, I did a record with Eve, I think, too. And, um, but I love, uh, I think Missy was just one of the uh, most uh, game changing presence i mean and the, the her ability to rap and sing and write and murder for other uh, right. other artists i mean yeah missy's and similar entrance because she started writing yeah, yeah. exactly and, and the pharrell connection there's a lot of connections she's there. just i mean wow if when you go back on her catalog like virginia not <laughs> she's timberland but virginia <laughs> yeah, connection. Yep, yep. And, and the song she wrote for swv and the, i mean right. oh, like beast bobby brown or johnny gill i gotta go bobby brown I love the boop, 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 boop. I love all that. Right. And I, I sang my, 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 like repeatedly. I was huge Johnny, I'm a huge Johnny Gill fan, but the my prerogative, the Bobby Brown, the don't be cruel, the humping on the ground, the tenderoni, like when I was a 14 year old. Cocaine dropping out of his pocket. Everything. 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 I love all that. And you know, and, and we did the uh, Real Husbands of Hollywood together. Oh, so so we, we family on that. We gotta talk about but that. I just think too. Bobby Brown, when Bobby Brown hit and he was rapping and Come singing and, and dancing, like that was, that was. Whew. And the run going back to New you know, New Edition is gonna be here on Friday. That was really? Chris Brown. Yeah, right, Friday? And, uh, that was. Yeah, yeah Friday. To the show. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. I, got, I, got, we, I got the car. Yeah, we got the car. Yeah, I want to fan. Oh, I, I ain't gonna lie. You know who? Who? Oh, the reason why I know that is Fat Joe hit, hit me. Told me he's gonna be here Friday, and I think he's coming just to go to the concert. Uh-huh. You know, he's a big like that, that fan of like <laughs> all, all, all that. Because isn't it they on tour? It's um, yeah, they're on tour. And, yeah. Uh, who else is they on tour? It's a couple people, and that's the wave of of entertainment is that you go through your hot phase, you co- and then all of a sudden it's just hot. Right, the show you're is back, hot, and everyone yeah. wants to see it, and it's coming to yeah, town. The nostalgia you know, comes back, and it's sentimentalities, and it's, and, <laughs> and remembering. I mean, that's the, the beauty of music is how it connects to the journey of your life and reminds you of those eras and times, you know, and some of the best times of your life. Music is a time machine; it, it Absolutely. transports you. Absolutely, yeah. Pharrell or Kanye. Got to pick Pharrell, of course. I'm with you. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, Pharrell, you know, out of everybody that I've ever been around uh, as an artist, Mary J. Blige, recording Mary J. Blige vocals or recording Jay Z vocals, uh, that's hard to surpass. Right. But being in the studio and watching Pharrell create yes. has yes. got to be one of the most magical things you can be around. The yes. speed, the authenticity, the the passion, the pa- the and just the, the the cleverness, the he the, and the lyricism, the melody. Like there isn't a part of it he can't do all on his own. That's right. the genius. There's so many of us. We need someone to help us with the bass, and we need someone to help us with the lyric, and we need someone to help us with the the melodies. But that guy, there's nothing he can't do. Just a genius. The, when you use the word genius lightly, yeah, you don't use it lightly on Pharrell. Right. He's a genius. That's what's up? Brandy or Monica? Got to pick Brandy. That's my girl. Okay. We did it. We had our first song together. Our first cut. He's like a quick time yeah, champ. Yeah, but I mean, some of them are easy if they're <laughs> if they're so connected. You know right. what I mean? Because I'm not picking music over music. I'm picking connection. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> whatever, 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 yeah whatever, whatever the criteria. We tell people yeah. whatever the criteria I'm not for you is. Judge music. You got it? Mariah or Janet? Jackson. Oh, Janet. Got to pick Janet. Now, Mariah vocally, when she came out with Visions of Love, I remember I was pro- I, and I, this is when I before my voice changed, I could hit all the octaves. Right. I could hit the fifth octave Mariah high notes. Like before and I, puberty? Yeah, before puberty. When I was 11 years old, right? When Mariah hit, was his right. Visions of Love is, is uh, 89. Yeah. You know, so maybe I'm 12, so it's right before, so I'm still the last year I could hit that high note. Uh-huh. And But I remember I learned every single riff and, of Mariah's. And I didn't even realize most of my, can I get some water, sorry? Most of my, um, Most of my studying of riffs and runs came from Take Six. I listened to uh, the, the, the Take Six albums, and, the, and, and I, if you learn how to sing like Take Six, you can pretty much do anything. Right. Mm. So that's where I learned most of my riffs. But Mariah, when she came out, I didn't even realize until I would listen back to my records, like the earlier records I made, how many Mariah riffs I was running. You know what I mean? How much right. he influenced me vocally. Okay. So Justin Bieber or Justin Timberlake? Oh, that's a tough one. Take a shot. Man, that's a tough one. <laughs> of, all, of, all, of all the people who are across the world, they want you to not pick. I'm just telling you, they that's don't want great. white on white crime out here. All right? So, no white on white crime. No white on white crime. They don't want that. <laughs> no white on white crime. <laughs> <laughs> all right. By the way, I made that one up. That's, that was, Man, that was a good one. I was like, <laughs> I was like <laughs> that's not on the list there, but let's go. <laughs> 
That's good. I know, you know, because I'm, I want to be respectful. I'm going through, I'm, I'm going through it. Yes. All right. Yeah. Buster or Eminem? Ooh. Oh, I got to pick Buster Bust. We got a few records together. And once again, uh, you remember, remember when they had this thing, um, the, the you could order videos back in the, the box, the box, the box. The box. Yeah. I remember when my dad first got the first the box bill. <laughs> when he came home and I had ordered three hundred dollars worth of videos, <laughs> and my dad was like, "No more the box." Most of the I remember uh, I watched the leaders of the new school. Um, uh, at least uh, 20 times. Right. I thought that video, that first video of Bussa uh, and Leaders of the New School was incredible. And then, of course, the scenario and the whole tribe connections. And 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 so when you... And then you get to uh, I'm, uh, the different vocal stylings that he's done. You know what I mean? The, how he can change his voice up so much and lyrical styles. I really think that he's one of the most influential We've ever had. You and know? Buster ever gave you a, 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 a hairstyle? <laughs> yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> yo, yo, shout out to Buster Bus. Shout out to Bus. First one that called me. Buster was one of the first people that called me when I got divorced. Wow. When I got separated, wow. when it was public news. He called me. I remember I was at the airport. He called me and just let me know he was there for me. And if I needed anything or needed someone to talk to, that he had been through these things and that he would be there for me. Shout out to Bust. Yo, yeah. let me, let me tell He's you, such a great dude, too. He's Buster. iconic. Buster is my, my, my friend that I call for motivation. Like, when mm -hmm. it's time to motivate, like, if I could call Bust and be like, yo, man, shit ain't right, he, he, he's, he, he's going to be like, what the fuck you mean? <laughs> like, he'll give you that motivation that you need. I'm like, all right, Bust, I just needed that. He's like, right, I call you back. He'll be like, he, he ain't letting you have a bad day. He ain't letting you have a bad day. I'm just, he's, he's a great yeah. friend. One of my, he reminds me of one of my favorite lines from The Godfather with Brando is, uh, you, you can act like a man. You know what I mean? Like, Buster's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buster's like, I'm there for you. I'll hold you. And, and we, can have a, we can hug it out. But come on, let's yeah, get this. He's you gonna know. smack you around yeah, in a positive let's get it way. Done. Let's right. get the work done. Right. You know? now, now, this one, I'm going to be honest. I don't know which way this is going to go. Tupac or Jay Z? Oh, uh, uh, Jay, for me. I mean, uh, Tupac, of course, that we, there's no way to deny anything that uh, he gave us. But uh, Jay has, because we've gotten longer and more from Jay also, we've right, got, we right. continue to, right. to, to right now to be inspired by Jay. Right, every right. week, every month, the things he does, the way he handles In himself. Different ways, right. I mean, there's so right. much to be inspired by. Uh, still to this moment, as a husband, as a father, as a businessman, as a as an artist, you know, as a genius. So he's actually one of my favorite people in the world. Mm. Oh, wow! Yeah, and one of the one of the few people that that uh, when my father passed, that I've continued to just kind of once in a while check in with and ask for advice and when I need a when I need a grown man theory. <laughs> Jay's a, a beautiful person. Uh, digital or analog? Uh, I'm liking I'm liking digital now. I think that there's more to uh, uh, there's more on, to play with on the canvas with digital. Right. You know, I'm starting to get it. I was an, I was an analog head until recently, and now I'm starting to realize that the way that Travis Scott, you know, bends those notes and bends those basses and tweaks the 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 tuning. Mm -hmm. I've always been a straight ahead sing, you sing in tune, you play in tune, you know? Right, right. You know, you can have, I like the imperfections, that's why I use live music mostly, right. and that's why I don't auto-tune myself, because I like the imperfections of music. Right. But I do think that uh, the originality of what people are doing now with the sonics is pretty, pretty I, impressive. I always like analog because, to me, music sounded better when we had to be in the room together. Mm. Like right now, if, if we went to do a record together and I'm in, Dusseldorf, Germany, and you could be in, you could be in Austria or Australia, and, yeah. I, and we can do, and we'd be on the same level. But when you're in that room, like like, like you said with Pharrell, like when you're in that room, seeing him make that magic, it yeah. makes you want to bring out the best in you, uh, yourself. So that's yeah. the reason why I like the analog. Well, you like more. the culture of analog. I like the culture of no, analog. Yeah, right. yeah, but you're right. But that, the culture of analog is really just the culture of. Of um, doing it together right. in the same space That's what because I mean. it inspires collaboration. The like collaboration it inspires different phrasing. Right. It right. inspires like somebody. Like I know that you that some of those, like the Drake and Twenty One records, and the, you know they they have to be made in the same room because right. the way they're bouncing off each mm -hmm. other and the way they're complementing each other's verses and styles, and they're they're changing up. We're not just doing sixteen and sixteen and sixty, whatever it is. Right. I think it really uh, lends itself to a, a completely different. And now. 
It used to be we'd have the same loop run for three minutes. All right. that shit is over. Everybody's right. changing beats in the mm-hmm. middle of the song, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so, and this is great. This is great That's for, amazing. for music. And, and it makes it more fun for the DJs and everything. So I think we continue to love the nostalgia of the old school, but we have to embrace appreciate new, em- yes. and embrace that. And you could easily put a plug in to it. Just like, <laughs> then, then love, because then you love what Bruno does. You know, then <laughs> yeah. you're like, hey, Bruno, you know, you, you murdered, you know, the, the analog sound and the old school and great songs. Songwriting and strings and right. when somebody can do that, you right. know, you're like, well, here, here, but but not everybody can do what Bruno can right. do with the analog. Just so you know, I wanted to correct you because um, when you said the back and forth, Please. you can do back and forths. And, oh, it's Zoom yes, now. Yes, 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 yes. Like I, right. I've, I've done it before. No, where, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah I've done it before. That's where, a live stream. I've too. never done a, yeah. I, you know, I haven't done a live stream vocal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, collaboration session. You're right, but it yeah. does happen. I mean, I like, bet. you gotta realize all the technology is like available. It's, it's available. It's available. Well, that's the, the great and then, album right here. But see, just the way you that you said about movies, how uh-huh, the more yep, you exactly. learn. So maybe I want to envision 21 and Drake in the studio. Nah, I don't say they was not yeah, want to start that room with either. Please, I don't want no. You just say it's possible. I'm saying it's possible because I've done it. I'm not saying what they have done. I'm saying what I've done before, where I had to go back and forth with Capone and. um uh, he he also a skeleton of like you know him saying such and such, and he knowing I'm gonna say this, and then go and then we've been on the phone too a couple of times like yo right. go ahead send me a send me this 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 and leave this part open leave this part open so it's, it's been done before so yeah. I just want to say but it, I didn't say possible. 21 no, and no, Drake it, wasn't in the studio today I did not say that okay <laughs> please well, over her. okay right, so we ain't take no shot for that right okay. no. no we're good um go ahead go ahead um <laughs> Tory Lanez or the weekend <laughs> uh the weekend. Okay. This is Some a Canada shit right there. Yeah, Canada Connect. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I like? I like I like that he uh, t- it really shares his truth lyrically. Do you know what I mean? A lot of R and B or pop uh, uh, singers and they they try to just go for the hit a lot of the time. Right. You know, he finds a way to make hits by really truly telling his journey and his stories. Talk about the weekend. Yeah, yeah. and to yeah, me that's I, really I awesome. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And he's got an amazing voice. Thriller or off the wall? Ooh, that's a tough one. That's about I can't, but I can't. I don't want to say both. I'm gonna go thriller because the age that I was at, I had to go back to off the wall. It was my older friends that yeah. told me you need to go back to off the wall. Thriller. I was seven years old, and the thriller video. It was an event changed. when thriller it's no, came out. It's no coincidence that. Thriller came out when I was seven, and at seven I decided I wanted to be a singer. There's no coincidence. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, you took a shot anyway? Yeah, it was, it was there. Oh, I'm joining you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joining you. <laughs> Hold on, we took a shot? There. All right. <laughs> we took a shot for no reason just now. Really? We took a shot for thriller. Thriller. <laughs> He's all kind of guy. <laughs> I, have a, I have a driver, so. Cool, cool. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm not yeah. driving. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Dre or Puff? Ooh. Um, you know, Dre, uh, obviously, as the producer, as the uh, one of the greatest uh, producers in the history of music, uh, one of the great... Uh, but um, I've spent so much time around Puff and his family because of Andre Harrell. Right, the Andre. You know what I mean? And I've been a part of that, uh, that culture and the party culture. What I love about what Puff uh, does also is, and what Andre inspired and they did together was celebrating all of these achievements together and okay. continuing to lift each other up. Not, we're having a party and you can't come. No, we're having a party and everybody's coming. Right. And we're all going to be great and we're all going to lift up and we're all going to take pictures together and we're all going to support this movement that started, you know, uh, with guys like Andre and Russell and Puff and Dr. Dre. Okay. Al Green or Teddy Pendergraft? Ah. Uh, hmm. I'm so in love with you. Just gentle. Just so gentle. So sweet and gentle. <laughs> and, gentle. <laughs> and I'm a Teddy P man. Call the door! You know what I mean? I'll, I'll turn the lights off. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> turn them on! We'll do that too, but there's something about ah that I just, I, I go for. Okay. This, this one right here is going to be classic. MJ or Prince? That's that's the uh, that's the big the big question. It's like the Jay Z 
Nas, right? Like that's the, the oh, yeah, that's like, the baby Jesus and the adult Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it. It's all Jesus. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so which Jesus are you going with? I'm going to go, I'm I'm go with Jesus. Okay, I, no. no wrong answer in no, Jesus. No, 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 the great thing is they both taught me uh, different things in different ways. Prince, uh, I learned my falsetto, I, or I improved my falsetto by practicing Prince. That was because his control of his falsetto was uh, extraordinary and unrivaled in some ways. So when I when I can sing a door and hit every note in the song, right. you know what I mean? I'm, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Michael, I mean, what the, the, Michael was the pioneer of all things, right. you know? And, and this is how you know Prince was ill. He literally had his ass out, and nobody was offended. <laughs> and, 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 and he was showing his ass. And he was. Yeah. Not heels, but whatever. He just went, <laughs> I like this song. It's okay. Yeah, it's yeah. No, no, one, no one plays no judgment. There's no love, judgment. I love this record. Uh -huh. <laughs> Did you ever link with Prince? I did. I have some great Prince stories. <laughs> Give us yeah. something. We love Prince stories here. <laughs> so I'm the whole at, room turned purple. I don't know if you've seen uh, uh, <laughs> I'm at One Oak. Every time, One Oak, LA. One Oak, no, this is New York. Okay, New York. Every okay. time I would uh, show show up at a club and Prince was there, somebody would come over to me and say, Prince is here and he wants you to, you know, come say hi. And so I would come and, and say hi the first couple of times, but then he would just sit there all quiet and wouldn't talk, wouldn't say nothing. When you're you sitting know. next to him? Yeah, we're just like, no, you just kind of like say hi, and then he just wants you to sit there with him. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> just be. Just be, just right. be with right. me, just you be. know, yeah. and hang. And I'm like, I, I get that, but I'm, you know, I want to go get wild over here. Right. <laughs> and you on this witness stuff, you know what I mean? Oh, this is uh, after he got well, back to the religion. Was, most of it, yeah, I mean, most of, I think he was, that was the last 12 to 15 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. You know, witness yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so, so one night we're at One Oak, and I go to the booth I'm usually at with Richie Akiba. Shout out to Richie, my boy. Mm -hmm. um, and Prince is there, and he's got a lovely lady with him and another friend. And uh, I say hi, and we shake hands, and then I'm sitting there, and he just is doing his, you know, sit still kind of thing. He's not even moving his shoulders or dancing. I'm like, you, you, you can dance your ass off. You're not even grooving. Right. So um, I tell uh, Rich, I'm like, yo, go get the mic and tell the DJ to play a kiss. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting about as far away from him mm -hmm. as we are now, uh -huh. and the record comes on. I just go, you don't have to be <laughs> beautiful. And I sing note for note the whole song. So as he's sitting there, and he, and he, but after a few lines, he like leans over, and he says something to the lady, like, "Who's that singing?" <laughs> and she goes, "It's Robin. He's right there." And he looks at me, and he, he just goes. <laughs> <laughs> For the next two minutes, <laughs> holy shit, make some noise for Prince, man. <laughs> That's Prince. You ain't got a Michael story? You got a Michael Jackson story? That was story? Prince. Mo, I wrote a, uh, Michael sang a song of mine. I had seems to use it. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a song. My Michael story is it was the day after the Grammys. It was uh, Madonna and Ricky Martin. Uh, no, Ricky Martin. Ricky Martin comes out on the Grammys and has his big blow up moment, right? He does Cup of Life, blah, blah, blah. So the next day, Tommy Matola is looking for a duet for Ricky Martin and Madonna, right? Madonna wants to do a duet with Ricky Martin, and Tommy needs the song. He calls Walter Afanasieff, who is the producer of um, uh, the Titanic, uh, Celine Dion song, mm. and all of Mariah's first three albums. Huh. So uh, Walter um, um, and I had started a song a few months earlier, and so he calls me up and said, I, get a, I got a call from Tommy Mottola. He's looking for a song from Madonna and Ricky Martin. I, and I think that song we started would be perfect for him. I'm in L.A. because it was the day after the Grammys. Mm -hmm. uh, can I come up to your studio and we finish that song, right? So the day after the Grammys, Walter Afanasieff comes to my studio. We finish the vocals on Fall Again. We send it to Tommy Mottola. Tommy says the next day, I'm, uh, this is so good, I'm sending it to Michael. <laughs> he bypasses oh, yeah. Madonna and Ricky Martin, <laughs> sends it right to Michael. Michael loves it instantly, wants to cut it. A couple days later, Tommy Mottola flies me to New York, puts me up at the Trump Hotel to write for Sony for the next 10 days while Michael's next door. I'm not allowed to be in the room with Michael, but uh, I'm next door writing for other artists. And I, that's when I wrote with Mark Anthony. Okay. Uh, so I'm writing with Mark Anthony while Michael's in the studio next door singing my song. Wow. <laughs> and I think I'm 21, you know, something like that. Um, and uh, so Michael ended up releasing it on his History album. Mm -hmm. And he kept all my vocals 
in the chorus. So it's him singing the verses and him ad-libbing, and it's all my voice on the chorus. So, so you I, gotta, I have a duet. Like, yeah, I have a that's duet. Ill. That's crazy. <laughs> Not many well, people can say that. And I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up my Michael Jackson story with. Um, I was supposed to, I had, I had released When I Get You Alone and he was a big fan of that song because I was doing Michael. Um, and so I was supposed to open up for him at the O2 Arena on July 12th and 14th. My whole family was going to fly out from Canada. My dad mm. was coming. They were about to book the tickets and Michael passed away. Damn. Yeah. So. Yeah. Stories. Stories. Uh... Otis Redding or Sam Cooke? I'm going to go Otis uh, just because he had uh, s- s- I had some kind of connection with his vocals and that I can't explain. I-, I think Otis might be, in the end, my very favorite singer. Hmm. Because the-, the pain turned into Any particular pleasure. cuts that... Open the door! <laughs> he, he's got a lot. <laughs> he, yeah, he just, the way he sings is just, there's something to own it. Oh, no, the, uh, the classic was the Try a Little Tenderness. If you, if you, there's some footage of him performing Try a Little Tenderness in the UK as this big, strong, powerful black man in the 60s for all these white kids. And it is, it's very special to watch and the way he sings and the I mean you feel something like the world is has to change right. after a person like this sings like this in front of these people right right <laughs> the world has to change <laughs> okay. Erica Badu or Mary J Blas uh, I got to go Mary J love Erica but Mary J and I through the Andre family and you know and and, right. and uh, because also she came first mm-hmm. and you know when you're younger Things can hit you a little harder. Do you yeah. know what I mean? The more you see, and the more, the the more, it, it all relates to who you first fell for. Mary J. Blige and Joe Desi and Guy, and that that was that was the foundation mm-hmm. of. And that's when Andre Harrell came to my house. I was like, "What? He's Uptown Records? Oh, I'm yeah. gonna sing for him." Right. <laughs> yeah, what he did with Uptown was incredible, cool. and then eventually with Puff and Bad Boy, what, what that all created was crazy. Yeah, you want to do next? One? Uh, D'Angelo or Bilal? D'Angelo. I used to play D'Angelo albums first when people would walk into my after parties. Mm. It would always start with D'Angelo. <laughs> we need that D'Angelo. was the warm. We need him on drink. Yeah, yeah. D'Angelo, come D'Angelo. on. That was the warm up. You start with D'Angelo. New Edition or Jackson Five? You know, mm. uh, uh, for me, generationally, it would be New Edition. Obviously. Uh, or not obviously, but in my opinion, catalog-wise, you know, the Jackson 5 catalog is, is uh, so deep. But I grew up in the New Edition era, and when they split, I had all the albums. I had the Johnny Gill album, I had the Ralph Tresvet album, I had the BBD yeah. album, I had the, the, you know, so there was... They were like the first Wu-Tang Clan back then. No, oh, they yeah, definitely were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you said oh, ABC, oh that's my a part God. of that. And, and everything broke yeah. off, and the remixes, and the, the out and the style, too, the outfits the BBD yeah. had. I had the backwards overalls with the writing. Yeah. Absolutely. That run that they've had, you Absolutely, know? I had all and of it. they still having it. No, that's what I'm saying, even till now, but incredible. TLC or SWV? Vocally, uh, SWV. Um, yeah, I, I would have, for me, I would have, because I'm a singer, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a sang singer. Huh. So uh, when I think of weak in the knees, like the huh. people that I literally would sing and practice their vocals over and over again, TLC was more like, these. they're just the coolest, funnest, and you jam along and they make, they, they have the most incredible personalities, but the vocals of SWV really got to me. Okay. <clears throat> Loyalty or respect? Man, that's a. I gotta go both. That's the, that's the one time. I gotta Jeez, go both. Uh, that's the, that's got, got, I got it for that one. Nah, go cause, go. Go. You can't really have one without the other. Yes, yes. Make it go for that. But I like that. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true. Because you gotta you think about it. You can't have one without the other. <laughs> What's that? Love and marriage? Yeah. Love, love and marriage. marriage. Loyalty and start. respect. I, I always thought I was the black Al Bundy anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yes, sir. But we, we we play this game all the time, and the, the thing is, that's all, the one time that we're not trying to be tricky. Is I think loyalty and respect is just hand in hand. I think you I think you have to have both yeah. in order to exist. But uh, yeah, so let's get now that we got that out the way. Let's get to 
blurred line. Oh God! Should we take a smoke break? <laughs> Get, get you know up. what? Smoke a cigarette in here, man. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, man. I just don't want to do it on camera. I just didn't want to do it on camera. You, you, you want to do it on camera? Yeah, All right, then. Cool, dude. Now go off. Go off. I need a little sugar, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll do it. I don't want to get it on camera. All right, cool, cool, cool. I respect, I respect that. That's what I want to get, get back to that because one of the things is uh, the Malibu fires. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how did that happen? What, well, um... It had started over on the uh, other side of the hill in the valley, San Fernando Valley, and it was beelining straight for our neighborhood uh, wow. during the night. So wifey was checking, you know, uh, the uh, updates and everything. And then around 6.30 a.m. I got up to get ready to take my son to school. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a nine-month-old daughter and wifey was pregnant. So the fumes and the smoke that were coming were so bad that I was like, you know, we, we got to get out of here. I don't want I don't want any of us breathing this stuff. So let's just get out of here. So we started packing up. And then around uh, 8 a.m., right when we were about to leave, it was a mandatory evacuation uh, for wow. the whole city. Damn. So we knew something was wrong. So I I went and grabbed my uh, my music first. I went and got the computer that, you know, got that all the music. And I got my, my guitars, I got my dad's photo albums, I loaded up everything I could into the car. Uh, I, I got a few suits, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and my son packed a bag. I was like, pack up. And he just put like a pair of underwear and a book. And <laughs> I was like, dude, you better grab some shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we got in the car, uh, headed uh, north to Santa Barbara, and then went around to her family, who's down in um, Huntington Beach. And spent the night with them, and when we woke up the next morning, we, somebody sent, a neighbor sent us pictures of, uh, you know, our just rubble, the whole of, thing. Of just your rubble. House. Yeah, just oh. into rubble. The funny thing was, I have a carport. Right. The carport wasn't touched. I could have taken all the furniture. The only, the, and the thing that really bugged was my piano that I wrote all of those songs on in oh, 20 years damn. burned. Yeah, that one hurts. But thanks, shout out to Yamaha for sending me a new one. <laughs> you good? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, high. You can do that new one, That is crazy. Because that new one's supposed to be on the way. So, that's, that's what's crazy about California is you guys actually have earthquakes. You guys have fires. Like, yeah. like, 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 why is California this beautiful place that y'all still stay at? I think it's just 70 degrees every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, I remember Jimmy Ivey told me that. He was like, I moved out to California. I worked in, you know, New York my whole life. Then moved out to California. And I was like, I'm never going back. Right. <laughs> and I think some people have that. You know, some people are diehard New Yorkers. And some people are like, man... You know, the, the, the New York struggle is hard, too, you know, right. it, it, and uh, sometimes you're looking for a little... That's why a lot of New Yorkers like to go to Florida, too, you know? Right, yeah. But but there's nothing... Nothing makes you stronger than New York, you know what I mean? And, and like, noise. <laughs> like my, my New York friends, I wouldn't be, like, I, I wouldn't have been able to handle... Like, when I need... When I need shoulders, I call my New York friends, you yeah. know what I mean? And they know how to how to... You know, give you that that pep talk and that let's get back to it game. You know what I mean? And sometimes I think us uh, Californians, <laughs> mm -hmm. we just wallow in that sunshine. Slower, slower Is this sunny again? <laughs> but, but you I, learn a lot from New York from, do, from New Yorkers. But Malibu is one of my favorite places on earth. Period. It's a re it's a retirement mm -hmm. spot, and I didn't realize that that, that what I, when I moved out there it was because I had a son and I had this new uh, lovely lady. Shout out to April Love. And uh, and I wanted to have a big family, you know. And so we had three kids, and and it's beautiful and it's gorgeous. But also, I really miss the the. I used to live in the Hollywood Hills, and I'd have Andre stop by every couple of days, and we'd smoke one, and I'd I'd pick up on some culture. He'd bring some friends by, get some new information, and that really inspires the music, right. you know what I mean? Muscle. And so so once you get out into your little bubble, and it's just me having to create out of thin air all the time, and I don't have all this information no and right. flow, you know, um, it's a little more challenging sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. So I miss I miss the, the the energy and the flow. Might be moving to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me ask you because um um I one thing that happened in, in Miami was we, people had hurricane insurance. Yeah, but not flood insurance, which was like like I remember like me when I first moved out here and they, it was some type of storm or whatever, right? I forget what it is, but it was it was Sandy. It was Sandy? Yeah. yeah it I was thought Sandy, Sandy was New York. I thought that was... No, that went all the way... Oh, okay. Well, well, it was and, one of, and Katrina. Okay. Katrina flooded Katrina, my, hey, my, hey, my hey, studio. Yeah, yeah. So, my so studio a lot goes. of people had hurricane insurance. That's, that's how people got over. I mean, it wasn't getting over. They said, well, 
it wasn't the hurricane that caused damage to it. It was the actual flooding, right. which is a whole different. It's it, mandatory now, though, to get flood insurance. Mandatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so when your situation happened. Did you have insurance for that? Was I got lucky. Yeah, I, okay. I actually, about a month uh, before, um, I was going through my bills, and I called my business manager, and I was like, uh, why am I paying so much for insurance? Right? And she was like, there's a lot of fires out there. <sighs> Thank God. A month later. Wow. Thank God. I paid that bill. And, and you know, four years four years later, uh, in hindsight, I got a brand new home. You know mm. that I built for my kids, that right. I built for my. I got my own little man cave outside with my fireplace and my barbecue. Yeah. You know, right. and I got everything lined up so the kids are right there and their t- play areas is right there and the treehouse and all that. So, you know, I think that uh, you get through your toughest times. But what was important to me, especially when that happened with my son, was. To, to show him how we survive as a family, that's when you have to lead uh, by example and, and keep the laughs coming, keep the joy coming, and let let them know that you're going to be okay, we're going to be okay, and tough times make us strong. You know, and metaphorically, rebuilding your home is just showing your kids, like, look, you just it comes apart, you rebuild it, you keep and going. we have each other. Like, right. really, let's focus on right. gratitude. The physical, of, yeah, yeah, of we're exactly. we're alive, we're healthy, we're together, and we're, we have a home. We have a roof right. over our heads. You know? That was like the chain of events for you, right? I think. I think the house. Oh you know, yeah, I had a run. I had I got uh, divorced, sued. House. Uh, my father passed away. My manager passed away. My house burned down, and then Andre passed away. Jeez. <laughs> I lost all three of my my uh, big brother father figures. You know, in wow. in a couple of years. Yeah. Now now I, me as you know being a fellow entertainer, I always knew. I never got over my father's death, right? Yeah. I never, I never did. I never, um, like, I, I, I buried it with, with music. To tell you the truth, I, I'll be honest. I remember on the day my father died, Chris Lighty came to see me as my manager, who yeah, passed away. I know Chris, Chris, yeah. Chris Lighty as well. Love you, Chris. And he, he told me straight up. He was like, "Yo, it's either we can get off of this tour. I was on tour. I had the number one record oh as my, my father God. died, right? Number one, number one record, number one album in the country." Don't know what it means at this time. I'm oh 20, 22, 20, whatever. But I remember him saying to me, like, yo, it's either we get this money back or we can just stay. And in hindsight, that was the right decision. It was. You worked through the pain. It was the right decision. Yeah. But later on in life, I could still feel like I never got over it. Yeah. So, I mean... As a person who lost my father too, obviously my father wasn't as famous as your father was. But he was your hero. But he was, was my hero. Father. He was my hero. He yeah. was he was literally my hero. I hear you talk about your father. Yeah, it's my hero. So how is that coping with with this? How do you do? You well, I uh, I had three kids in a row. Mm-hmm. That, that was him working for you in heaven. No, I three more meetings. No, no, you know what? I I I had to fill the void. Mm-hmm. I had to fill the void. It, it it and and I don't know if ten kids could fill the void of right. my father. You know what right. I mean? Right. But uh, but they definitely uh, have given me a, a purpose, given me love, smiles, and and made and made me wake up every day with something to do that I love doing. That's dope, man. That's dope. How much has being a father changed the the day to day business of oh. doing this? Oh my gosh! Well, let's just say we don't drink tequila unless we're on drink camp. <laughs> <laughs> Good parenting one on one. But no, I, I think that uh, you know if you're going to get up at six thirty and be present, and I I take my kids to school every morning. I'm up I'm up right. at six thirty. I want I like to be the first face they see. I like to give them their muffins and their pancakes, and and uh, I like to take them to school. And then once I know they're at school and they're loved and they're uh, they're they're feeling good Being about nurtured, themselves, right. then I can go to my job. You know what I mean? Right. So that's that's I I like to prioritize my day as my kids come first. They know that their dad loves them and got them to their thing on time. Right. Well, sometimes on time. Right, right. <laughs> and then dad goes to get his exercise or work on his music, blah blah. And then we finish the day as a family. You know. Right. That was the that was the one thing about you that was super impressed off top was you know we do this a lot. And you were on time. You were three minutes early. <laughs> I was like, I, I, and then I think you had your shit together. You had your, your people coming out. They start filming you. I said, oh, they, they, they y'all was very professional. I was out there like this. I, I, out there, doing the thing, watching. 
Oh, you broke the blinds? <laughs> what? Yeah, I got you. You broke them. That could have been me. Maybe, maybe I don't know. But I looked, and I was I was just so impressed because that's the thing about uh, the business is a lot of us take shit for granted. Yeah, especially early on. And and mm-hmm. and, and, and I, I'll tell you who, who taught me this. One of my idols, uh, his name is Leo Combs. Yeah, Leo. And I could never beat Leo Combs to a meeting. Never once could I ever be him. Like, I would try to come a half an hour early, and he'll be looking, I, I knew you was going to try this, yeah. and I'll come an hour early. And That's he'll so he'll funny. always, like, we'll have a meeting at 4. That's so funny. And he'll be there at 1.30. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, and he's like, I knew you were going to try to beat me. Like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. It, I, to me, that was always impressive, like because you don't waste no one's time. Yeah, a person's time is 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 so valuable, and the fact I know without, without me like fully knowing you, I know that you are a great person because oh, thank you can't you. Can, it's, 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 just, it's a certain things about a person that I have to assess in fifteen seconds. Right. And you you met every criteria in fifteen seconds. Right. Yeah. Right. Like as, as, as I, I I walk in my father's shoes and uh, and he he loved people he loved the business he loved uh, you know just doing this whole thing man and and I used to get scared when I was I used to hold on to my music too precious right. and so I wouldn't show myself I would hide myself and that's why it took me time to become a performer. Because I just wanted the music to do all the talking. I didn't want right. it to do anything else to matter except the music. And then that's what this Mass Singer show has been so great for me. Because working with a guy like Dr. Ken and, and, and letting him make fun of me, letting everybody make fun of me, it's, it's really become my new superpower, which is mm-hmm. I can laugh at myself. Right. right. And I can, I can appreciate the things that I'm good at and, and, and what I can do. And then I can laugh at what I'm not good at and what I can't right. do. You know what I mean? And that has, be, has really changed my life. Yeah, and allows you to, to laugh enjoy at myself. Life, oh, right. I mean, because I don't know if I would have done this uh, ten years ago. You know, I would have been too scared of anything that I w- didn't right. want to be known for or say. Right. But I've become comfortable in my skin by uh, being the butt of the joke every once in a while. Right. Right. <laughs> and it's relieving. And it's, it's relieving. Yeah, right. it is. Now let's, let's talk about uh, sex therapy. Yes, and sir. Is sex your therapy? Um, or is well, it the opposite? Have, have you, you need seen, therapy for sex. Oh, so you need therapy for sex. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think that w- the therapy comes in all forms. I think, uh, you know, a little Jay w- watching the sun go down is therapy. I think uh, me swimming with my two-year-old son in the pool is therapy. I think it's all you ma- making sure that you balance enough of, of your life to get the joys of, of everybody in your life and all the experiences you can accumulate daily, weekly, and monthly. So for me, the therapy is really just a change of whatever I'm, I'm doing right now. The, the next happy thing is therapeutic. The next right. happy thing is that making dinner for my kids is, is therapy. Do you know what I mean? I like to go to Costco's. Yeah. <laughs> I like to go to Central I put on, I put on a mask, <laughs> little, little sunglasses. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Do you put on a mask and yeah, like, I, By the way, I love the mask. Because, like, you know, I want to be right. Oh, you mean too. the COVID the mask? mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you put that on now? I, like, every now and then, yeah. I put it on. I go, you know, when I want to go somewhere to a hotel or something like that. <laughs> like, I'll put it on, put the glasses on. But it's like, it's like it didn't matter because I'll be walking through and somebody would be like, What's up, Nori? I did everything for you not to recognize me. And that's the first thing. And like, it doesn't matter. I think it's my eyebrows. <laughs> my, my eyebrows is Robin Dick. <laughs> I can't hold it, boys. Yeah. Oh, okay, but all right. Let's, look, I, I, I got so much notes. Because your life, your life is really dope. Like, it's really dope. <laughs> it's been interesting. It's been interesting. It's been interesting. Still is. So, uh, okay. Let's, let's get to magic. Okay. Let's talk about magic for a second. How, where was you at? Well, uh, this was, uh, this is when um, I was going through, a, I had just had my first uh, success, real success with Lost Without You and the Evolution album. And 
everything was happening very fast. I, I did Oprah a couple times and, and you know, was really feeling like, you know, I remember Paula at the time, she would say, well, we're, we're not crazy. We're not crazy with, you know, your music. Like, people okay. do like your music. Right. <laughs> You're sitting there, like, thinking these songs are really good. Right. Right. And, and then, you know, it, it finally it... it uh, reaches the people and, and gets that kind of response and you're like, okay, we're not crazy, let's keep going. So, uh, you know, Magic was really about believing and, and also it was Paula, Paula was becoming very um, successful and her and I wrote that song together. She came up with a lot of that. Wait, what? Yeah, Magic, yeah, that's a lot of that's Paula on that oh, song. Wow. And Paula uh, would, would, was great at being able to throw out lyrical ideas, you know what I mean? Uh, when I would get stuck on something, I'd be like, I got this great track, but I just need to, I don't, I don't know, I don't like what I'm singing over it. And she would come up with a little something and give me a spark, and she was amazing at that. So she, uh, she her and I wrote Magic together. I think some of it was based on, do you remember the book The Secret? Yeah, the absolutely. Secret. Yeah, everybody knows so that. So the, 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 the idea of The Secret is, I got it, you got it, we got the magic, we can make the pain disappear, you know, um, and we can erase the past. Um, uh, stuff like that. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Damn tequila. Mm -hmm. We can make the future shine so bright, uh, and we can make right now all right. So it was about the power that, uh, of, of having magic in all of us, that we yeah. all have a magic that we can change our lives, change our futures, and change our course. Power of intention. Right. And by the way, the, your record with uh, Trey Song was Bad Girl with Trey Song. Bad Girl. Yeah, because you got so much hits, he, he, he forgot. <laughs> was that Boogie with the Hoodie? Hey, Boogie with uh, the Hoodie. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I, I remember it being a Boogie record. I forgot Trey was on it, too. That's yeah, right. Yeah. By, the way, by the way, that's like you, know, you went to the bathroom, and I was just sitting there reminis just talking just now. And I was like, yo, he, he, he forgot he had a hit record. <laughs> like, who forgets that you have a hit record? That is a dope problem to have. Well, that yeah. Is, that's a dope problem. Trey Song well, you might be a little great. mad you don't even remember, but yeah. it's still a good problem to well, have. That's, that's because it was more recent. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was more recent. And that was one, once again, digitals. That was right. like where I wasn't with Boogie, so I don't, I don't have a studio right. experience. Right. I don't no have picture. a... I wasn't there with yeah. Trey, you right. know what I mean? Yeah. So when I hear it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Mm. So yeah, some of those things don't register as much when you have that visual um, that experience, experience yeah. right? And you got a song called Brown Liquor. That's the new one with Gotti. Yeah, with Gotti. That's the new one with Gotti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo. You guys haven't heard this? Yeah, come on, make some oh, noise. We should, let's play it. Can we play it? Let's play it. Can they play it? Yeah, Gotti. Oh, this, oh, this Bobby bumps. play it. Play the one with Gotti. Let's hear it right now. This one bumps. We, we should have set this up a little bit better. Okay, I mean, let's set it again, because we're going to sit here. Well, I got to take a pee pee. Yeah, take a pee -pee. Oh, the video drops tomorrow. The video, the video drops, drops tomorrow. tomorrow. It's going to be already be out there, God damn it. The video drops tomorrow. You know what's, you know what's so dope about you? All the accolades we spoke about earlier, everything we spoke about what you went through, to see your passion when you just played your new record, to you still have that passion. I lost my shit a long time ago. Uh. Like, like, what I'm trying to tell you is, I, 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 I don't want to say we have similar lights, but we have, you know, um, I believe you're 45 years old. I'm 45. Just turned 46. Oh, okay, then you older. You got yep. me by one. Huh? But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so when we look at the years. And the thing is, I, I admire you, you still having passion. Oof. Like, that shit, because cause this is the reason why, I, like, a lot of times people will ask me for a verse. Or they'll ask me to be a part of their music, and I'm kind of, like, done with that life. Yeah. But it's a good thing that I'm done with that life. What I mean by that is, if I'm not 100%, I can't do it. Right, right. So I wouldn't waste nobody's time. But for me to see you just now, I just was... I was doing my peripheral vision shit. <laughs> so I didn't want you to know I was just watching you, but I, but I was watching. And when I seen your smile come on, the fact that you still have passion yeah. for music is phenomenal. Well, the you fact you used to have passion, period, because you had such a dope light, you have so much things to, and, and you could still, I saw that smile. But you know what I love? I love the, there's nothing better than love and there's nothing harder than love. You know what I mean? And so I always have something to write about. Mm. Always, because I'm in love, you know what right. I mean? And I love my kids, and I miss my dad, and I miss Andre, and there's so much love in my heart for so many of 
people in my life mm -hmm. that all I need to do is have the space and the quiet to tap into that love mm -hmm. and there's something to talk about, you know? Now, this song is more of a fun sex, yeah. but in the sense, the, the lyrics are still, I'm talking about someone in particular. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and I'm saying, I only drink this liquor. Right. <laughs> and, and this record is on Empire Records, right? Uh, I think, no, this one, uh, the last album was with Empire. This okay. is uh, independent. This, this is just with me. Fully, yeah. fully. So yeah. What, is it Empire independent as well? Well, I mean, this is... This right, is, it would be going through Empire as an imprint, kind but of. But not other. this particular song right, right. now, yeah. Right. But you're, you're putting I'm it out trying, yourself. Yeah, because I'm like looking for, I'm actually, I'm, I'm formulating the new album and looking to, for the new distribution deal, but I want to have most of the album done, you know? I want to have the records the lined up. This is this was the, the teaser, like the teaser single, yeah. But a teaser single, so it's not even... Oh. I don't know if it's good, you know, I don't know, radio hasn't quite picked it up, so okay. I think it's going to be more of just an underground jam. But I got to ask this, because you said this is independent so you pay for the video or did you get yes did you get do say you, you gotta ask the question though no no i i you know uh, where i'm going yeah. i got i got a little money but no most of this is self-finance okay self-finance yeah because yeah. we have another famous question that we always ask major or independent Oh, well, I think for a young artist, uh, a major label deal is, is, can be very helpful. Um, I think. You think today, in today's environment? No, I, I mean, I, I'm, I think that there's just so many different outlets. But I do think Whoa. that the support of a major label system, I do think that the deals need to be re, right. re reworked, obviously. Uh, right. I don't think there's, a, there's fairness within the, the structure. But I do believe that I do miss. The Jimmy Iovine roundhouse Right, well, that's what, that's what he misses. <laughs> he said it when Jimmy Iovine just goes, wow. When Jimmy Iovine calls you at 7.30 in the morning and says, this is the best record you've ever made, it's going to be number one all over the world, and then it is, right, right. you missed that. Yeah. I, I, listen, I'm so sorry. It, it seemed like I prepped his answer. I did not. No, no, no. No, I'm a big Jimmy Iovine fan. Shout out to Jimmy Iovine. I, I say huge it all fan. the time. I say, as long as you had a good deal, Majors is not the problem. As long as you have a good deal, right. meaning like you, you you negotiate what you want, right? Right. But I don't that, even think you mean that though. To be honest with you, good deal because I think you're talking for it to be to have a hit record. I right. think yes, the artist that has no. Hit, I don't think a major. I don't think a major is good for a hit record. I think a major is helpful in the. Um, overall international worldwide promotion of a brand new artist. If the label's behind you. And that's, that's always behind. been our debate. If I feel the label's like behind there's, you. It, for, for every artist that had a great experience at a label, there's yeah, 10 there, below or them. Or 100. That, or, or more. 100. I'm just, you know, yeah. trying to, but yeah, no, there's a, a ton that didn't have it because they didn't have the label backing them. But True. I'll tell you this. As an artist, there's no worse a feeling in the world. I know worse is not a word. I get it. I get <laughs> it's it. a drink chance word. It's a drink chance word. There's no worse a feeling than dropping a hit record, you knowing it's a hit record, and then not becoming a hit record. Right. That right. shit hurts. Yeah. And a major label gives you more of an opportunity for your dream to come to fruition. Because what I'm trying to tell you is, like, after a while, you got to remember, you make a hit record, and then they say, well, yeah, it's not as good as the last shit. Right. You fell off. So... You gotta go in and make another hit record. And as an artist, when you give it to an independent who not who's not familiar with the radio station in Atlanta, not familiar with this one station in Las Vegas, you do the proper thing. You automatically add it. Well, They're that's what you went wrong. With that. You went wrong already. You said right. when you give it to an independent, you should be the independent. This is what I'm you shouldn't to say. be giving it to another independent no, label. What I, what I, what I, no, I didn't mean I didn't mean that. You're right. So okay. <laughs> when you hire, when you independent, you have to hire a staff. You still have to try to do right. everything a major label right, is, right. Is, 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 is to do it because you want that major label win. And boy, when if you if you don't have that great, there's market, nothing like the machine. It's nothing like there's the nothing machine. like the machine. Listen, the Jimmy machine. Yeah. Yeah. We can all agree at, to that. We Leo love you, Jimmy. Yeah. Wherever you at, uh, Kevin you, Lyles, Mike Kaiser. Don't think Mark that Pitts. the work that Mark <laughs> Pitts. Uh, don't think that the work that y'all doing at these major labels is going unnoticed because it's still. No, I, I'm being honest, and and, and I, this is what I recommend for every new artist. Your first three albums, you go on a major, and then after they spend that $20 million on you, then you can spend that $20 million on yourself. 
Yeah. I would say it backwards. In today's in today's climate, if you could go lucky. out there on social media, yeah. don't do much and just make whatever music that resonates with your audience, yeah. get these followers and these likes or whatever you need to do. True. And the labels, they're lazy now. They're not they're not they're not developing artists and, anymore. And they're you, plucking you'll, you. You'll be able to control you can control the deal. you can have a better deal at a major use the machine when you come up as an independent and then come out of that machine a lot more whole. But most of those records come from the streets. And only Absolutely. the streets have the urge Urgency and the and the and the that deserve the immediate attention of the listener. Do you know what I mean? Right. Because when there's some fresh on the street, you know that, that they like when Fifty was coming or these records right. are coming, these artists are coming. You know the labels know, and uh, and that's why I, I agree with you. I think if you are, if you already have heat. But if you need the producers and you need the songwriters right. and you need then the label is going to connect you with those. If you if you're Gotti's camp and you just got records and video directors and guys coming straight yeah. from the streets okay. in your neighborhood, then you got to I mean he's got a cash machine. I right. think that's a great example cuz 50 50 had the streets already. Like 50 did before it dropped independent. Yeah. God bless, independent. Mixtapes. But, but when he got with that label, he got Ooh, with Eminem. And he got but that's, he what, got that's what we've been saying. It was yeah. the biggest I've always said ever. that. Yes, be that be was, independent that, so I, you can I, take I, advantage I, of the I, machine. I honestly think yeah. 50 could have still been one of the biggest artists without them, but he became one of the biggest superstars with them. Yes, like, he yeah. became... like. I love looking at Tony Yale's Instagram and seeing these motherfuckers in places I can't pronounce. <laughs> And they just sitting there. I love that shit. I'm like, like this is this is it. Like, cause I saw it from the beginning. So again, I love this argument. I mean, yeah, it's a good argument. No, and real quick, that, just to give a, a quick analogy, He's super independent. No, yeah. the quick analogy I would give is is like you're a small business owner doing it on your own. Yep. And you're 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 succeeding at a. You reached your your ceiling of success, but you're right. succeeding, and now you can go to the bank and ask for that. Credit line that's like a million dollars, you, you know. Can, that's yeah. what that's what the labels are. They're right. they're credit lines, you know. They're but they're banks. They're, but but you also they're the want, worst banks they ever. No, I mean but, with, with experts. But with you experts. want to appreciate it, and because as we've had the honor to work with the other people below the CEOs, there are uh, great um, uh, video heads, marketers, there are great marketers. Yeah. There are great, there are people with connections. I've worked under there some are people of them. that know how to talk to people that the artists can't. Absolutely. And the artists can't get on the phone and hold a conversation. With the marketing team and with the blah 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 team, and you know, and so they need those teams to go out into the I world agree. for them, yeah, right. and and uh, do the talking for them. So I think it's uh, their strength in numbers, right. right? You know what I mean? And you you can do as much you want to do as much as you can individually. Even me as and now I say I want to write the song, I want to I want to try to do everything on my own. Now if someone else comes in and has a better idea or wants to make it better, I'm all for it. But right. I've got to generate the magic from scratch, and then the other things will come. You know what I mean? And you know what else the problem is too. You get to a certain lifestyle that, that the label has provided for you, mm -hmm. you cannot dumb that down. That's, that's what hard. you like. That's what you really are nostalgic that's hard. about. That's, that's your hard. problem. I, I, you like that? Like that? I, 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 I like I that. Said, you I a fan on him. that one, bro? I watched, I watched him pull up, and I said, "See, that's record label shit." Right? <laughs> I mean, that's record label shit. Right? I know he's like record label. He, record label. Didn't, he didn't dumb his shit down. You would like, like what I'm saying is, if you was to sit here. And just to say, as he pulled up, was he major or independent? You would know. You would know off top. Listen, he's rolling like a major. He's, he, he's a That's because I got. A, I'm on a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> That's a major. 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 I'm on it. I'm on a You're TV a show. That's what I, That's where the car money's coming from. <laughs> By the way, that's hilarious. I love that. Holy shit. Okay. I, I got mad more. Okay. Truth. Okay. You this, wrote, this you wrote for Brandy. Good. You wrote for Brian McKnight. You wrote for Christina Aguilera. You wrote for Color Me Bad. Oh man, Color Me Bad. Color what me what bad. did you write for them? Their second album, I was 16 and I was working with Tricky Stewart and their second album, uh, Tricky was working with them and I wrote a song called Sexual Capacity or something like that that ended up being the, their single off their second album. 98 Degrees. Uh, yes, uh, I wrote a song with uh, Brian McKnight, actually. We wrote a song together that ended up on uh, 98 Degrees. Mark Anthony 
Jordan Knight. Now, who, who? Jordan was a big, uh, very important part of my uh, musical development. I'll tell you why. When I signed to uh, Interscope with John McClain and Brian McKnight and Jimmy Ivey and that, that team at 16, they had just signed, John had just signed Jordan Knight as a solo artist coming off of the New Kids on the Block. So John That's was the very... from New Kids on the Block. Right. So Jordan Knight was uh -huh. the lead singer of New Kids. Uh -huh. So, so Jim, jo John's like, uh, I think you should get in the studio with Robin. So Jordan and I meet in the studio and I ended up writing and producing like seven uh, of, of the ten songs on his debut album. Wow. And, I, and my first uh, hit top ten record was... Uh, baby, you know I can give it to you, which was produced with uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Wow! And so the amazing thing wow, about bro. the amazing thing about uh, Jordan, what he did for me, because they thought I was a great songwriter, but I wasn't a, a, a producer. I wasn't a real producer yet. So Jordan took me with him. That's how I met Walter Af Afanasiev. I got to work with Raphael Sadiq right after he worked with D'Angelo. I got to work with. Um, um, Teddy Riley, we got to go see, I mean, we, we literally went, I got to, to go, oh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, I got to go from the best producers camps in the world at the time wow. and learn from all of them when I was 18 years old. How, how did they treat you? Uh, they because I could sing and write. They, they, you know, I, I always got that kind of a. Oh, Did they oh, test you? Kid, no, they were just like this kid's got talent. You know, he wouldn't be here if he didn't. You know, so I was very lucky. But I, uh, to, as far as they were concerned, as long as you come up, you come up with stuff. Right. So when you come up with a great chorus and Jimmy's sitting there doing the bass line live, Jimmy Jimmy Jam, one of the most incredible right. musicians. Ah, there, there. I mean, Jimmy Jam. I learned so much from Jimmy. Those sessions with Jimmy were uh, just life-changing for me as a producer. Brian, as a vocalist, being in the studio session with Brian, learning how to do harmonies and record them, and, and then being in the studio with Jimmy Jam. And this is all by 18 years old, so I was blessed. We're talking about going to college, you know what I mean? And you also wrote for Maya and Pink, too. I did. I, I got to work with Maya on her... On her uh, debut album, uh, or I think it was maybe the second album. We did three songs together. Pink, uh, that was, uh, again, from the Tricky Stewart sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a song that we just wrote, and then Pink ended up cutting it, because that was the LaFace. That was when uh, Ellie Reed and um, Babyface were still together mm. at LaFace, and uh, they were feeding LaFace songs, and LA was putting them on his different artists. Okay, and then, so as I'm you know, going through your discography, there's a, there's a, a straight-up song. I thought it was like hidden, but it's a straight up song <laughs> called Cocaine. Yes. Straight. It's a good one too. It's a good, it's a great Cocaine. Cocaine. Uh, Couple people got excited in here. Look at that. He came, he came back when he heard it. Said, so I'll, I'll sing this just for fun because the lyrics, this is, this is a true story. You were like Peter Piper. Hey, that's a true story. Beverly Hills Hotel for AM. It's my birthday. I wanna stay young. I wanna have fun. I don't wanna be the only one. No way. Movie stars, models, and blondes and cocaine. <laughs> New York, LA is all the same. The angels look the other way. Cause they can understand my pain. Cocaine. I've been doing that. I've been doing that at the shows. You yeah, like, like, you like being racially profiled right now. <laughs> we are not racially profiling. He's nothing okay. <laughs> he used to. He used to, guys. He used to. He used to. But, but I feel. I feel uh, like other than the Sugar Hill Gang, there was no one that ever said said that. Actually, I think. Um, I remember when we were going to release it, the label said that there were some challenges. They wanted me to change the title. And then they realized that, then they realized that Eric Clapton had released a, fa a very famous song. It called took them okay. to, to notice that? To and, no, and then then they let it go. They let it go. White lines. Oh, I didn't. No, that wasn't no, no, Sugar Hill Gang. Like white lines on the shoes. No, no, no. No, he's got like a, he says coke. I think it's called Grandmaster cocaine. Flash and the Furious. Yeah. It's called cocaine. Melly Mel. Melly you, Mel. You can't patent the word cocaine, so you could just call it right. You can't, right? Well, I don't think so. I don't think <laughs> Yeah, cocaine's not owned by so. By the cartel. So the label, so you, you make this record and the label comes to you and says, Robin. I don't remember. I mean, label, you know, a manager called, somebody says that they're have, we're having an issue with the song title Cocaine. Obviously, I was coming, 
<clears throat> Your father was on. Yeah, my dad's a growing pains dad, sure. and we're still trying to pitch market me as a as an R and B white soul singer slash pop star or whatever right. they're trying to market me as. Uh, when it, and so um, I just uh, uh, I said, well, I don't really want to change the song title. I mean, it's kind of what the song's about. Right. <laughs> it's, it's about cocaine, guys. Yeah, it's about- <laughs> And, and, you know, the, the, I had never tried it, and it was really about the culture that I was seeing um, uh, as my presence in, in young Hollywood and how much I saw of it and how much it scared me. And so it's all about the fears of, I don't want to be the only one who's not doing it, and I don't want to be, you know, but you're, you're, it's really about the peer pressure of being around movie stars and, and models and all these things, and everybody's doing it, and, you, you know, you don't want to be the only one. You don't want to be the... <laughs> <laughs> you don't be the proof. One, one of my first um, uh, uh, times in California, I'm sitting up there, and I didn't know how much of a commodity having cigarettes was for this community. And a was guy comes up. Cocaine community? Guy comes up to me and <laughs> said, I'll give you eight ball for a Newport. <laughs> You should have said deal, and then you sold it to Diego. <laughs> I, but by the way, by the way, guys, I'm green as fuck. I'm like just coming to Hollywood. I don't, I don't know. So I'm looking like what? And he's like, yo, right now. And I'm like, holy shit. And then I didn't yeah. realize. And then I realized I was the only one in the party that wasn't on that cocaine. I was like, oh shit. But I, I felt like that. That's that was that was ill for you to like. Say that you know what I mean. I feel like be up up front. I think I think that was like genius. I think thank you. yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, I mean the things like I said. I always just try to say what I'm going through, and that's why mm. my songs are very uh, chronological. You know, right. like what I wrote and, and my song, my album titles. It's all what I was going through what very literally at the right. time. You know, love after war, sex therapy. Oh, I got that. I got all of those in my notes. Love after war. All of those in my notes. The oh. evolution. Uh, they were all literal periods of uh, my life. You know. So all right, now let's get the blurred line. Okay. Mm. I can remember I can remember me hearing about this lawsuit. Yes. The record is phenomenal. You know, um I started uh well, I don't want to say I started with Pharrell, but my second album, my biggest oh yeah, hit my- what 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 Super Thug was with Pharrell. Yeah. I seen how he works and I seen so when I listen to it cuz we listen to it today, we listen to Marvin Gaye's Record, then we listen to your record, then we listen to Blur Lines, then we listen to more. Oh, oh. again, back to back, back to back. I can hear where Pharrell didn't sample. He, he, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the average, the average person, how we were speaking about earlier, how sometimes being smart is actually being dumb. Like, like because you knowing too much, you, you you know too much. So when I kept doing it today, I kept listening back and forth to each 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 record. I can see it. Did you think that you guys was doing a uh was doing wrong by showing love? No, I mean, you know, the we uh I mean, there's been so much said about it right. that there's not I don't know if there's anything new I can really say. You it's new you can say here. The, the fact <laughs> The we, fact is, is that my my respect level of Pharrell's right. abilities and right. the fact that I was lucky to be in the room and he chose to write a song. The thing that's genius about him is he will look. He literally wouldn't have written that song for anybody else. Wow. Or I mean, I, I helped write it, of course. Right. But he, you know, the mastermind that he is. If any other artist is in that room, he won't write. He's not going to write that song. Right. He looks at me, my energy, the way we are, the thing he thinks I'll sound good doing. Blah blah. blah. It's all his, his mind works on many different masterful levels at the same time, yes. and he knows exactly what he's trying to conceptualize for this particular artist. Different from Ed Sheeran, different from yeah. Timberlake, different yeah. from Nor. Yeah. He knows this person. I'm going to do something completely different than I've done for anyone else. Well, that's what we got. It's it was uh, it's still it's still you put it on live when we do the live shows people go nuts as soon as it goes bump, bump, bump. Yeah. and so all we really wanted to do when we got into music was do what we love and make people feel like that right so I, I no matter what has happened since or in hindsight the feeling it still gives people right, right in front of my face right. is worth everything 
I'll say this story on Dream Champs a couple of times. When I met uh, James Brown, first thing James Brown said, because they, they, they came... <laughs> They came up to him and they must, they must have told him, like, his nephew or someone, he didn't know who the fuck I was. So it, he's like, that's, that's Noriega, he's a rapper. And James Brown looked up, he said, keep sampling my shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, damn, nigga. <laughs> I get a, get a, get a hug? I gotta get a five? I gotta get a selfie? Hey, like, it's like, but, but what it is is, those pioneers, they understand that we want our music to live on forever. And I, it's something that I had to deal with because I hate when people sample my music. I can't stand it. I'm sorry. I know that's being petty. Yeah, you are being petty on that. Fuck that. <laughs> I don't like it. You just bigged up. <laughs> what? What? You bigged them up for saying keep sampling my shit. Yeah, but I don't like it. But I'm yeah. saying it, 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 it. We've had George Clinton hey, here. Person, and, yes, and yes, and yes. Let's brothers. clarify so this doesn't become an issue afterwards. Let's clarify that none of us would ever speak for Marvin Gaye or his intentions. Yes. We are we are yes. pontificating because we're yeah. reflecting our own feelings. You say pontificating? Well, yeah. What the fuck does that mean? We're throwing we're out just, our ideas. We're just, yeah, we're, we're throwing said, out our ideas. We're throwing out our ideas because we're, 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 we're projecting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You and I are okay, projecting okay. how we feel yes, about yes, this. Yes, yes, yes. How right. we feel, yes. And I, we are in, in, in insinuating that Marvin might have felt the same way. We do we'll not never know. Let's make sure we leave this table without any confusion. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We're not uh, telling any other artist how to feel about somebody being inspired by or sampling their music, etc. To me, in my own world, right. if I if if somebody did a similar and was inspired similarly by my sound or music or vocals, uh, I wouldn't have the same response personally. Right. So I can only speak for myself. I, right. I want to make sure that we didn't have too nah, much tequila thank you. Thank you. and get into no, 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 thank you. speaking. No, no, no. Yeah, yes, you yes. Could, yeah. Please. Yeah. I mean, it's, I it's just because you know, and I, and also, I want to you know. Say like, there's certain records that, that they, they do over of mine that I do like. Well, I mean, there is the the situation where the estates get to listen to it and, and approve it if See, you're going mine, through those mine channels, is you know. Different because mine or the is person themselves, they're alive. None of that music that they sampling. So the feeling for you is different. Yeah. Yes. So if you actually do my record over trying to big me up, you're actually not. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually doing like, just well for but, let's but, get let's, let, let, I love that for but guess what guess what guess what guess guess what something that I had to notice have you ever seen Pharrell post one of those remakes no. not once because you know what I think me and him don't get we, we don't get what we deserve mm. so when a person samples our record and don't have to go through us I can understand it I can under you yes like he said like he said so. So yeah, so sometimes, so sometimes I do like when they sample it, and sometimes I don't. Um, have you ever been sampled? And you, 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 you I, I have been sampled. Um, my favorite version, uh, or one of my favorites, was Drake on one of his early mixtapes. Did uh, "Teach You a Lesson," one of my songs, and he sampled "Teach You a Lesson." And then that's the same record that uh, a boogie with the hoodie sample is God. "Teach You a Lesson." And did you feel like Nori? Um, I, I'll tell you a funny story when, when I, uh, just because I love, I love um, a boogie with the hoodie. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my man. But when he sent me the first version, and here I wrote this song as such a sweet, intimate, and like the first few <laughs> lines were like, so Bitch, hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. See, this one, don't see that. And so, so I did. I kind of hit up. My, I kind of hit him up, and I was like, hit my manager too. And I was like, you know, dude, maybe he could just lighten up yeah. the beginning a little yeah. bit, so yeah. we could sink into it, you know. Yeah. And he was cool. He didn't mind just kind of adjusting it out of respect cool. for the. Okay, the, I, the, you know, just, and it was it was only just the entry. It was like the, the entrance it was to blunt. the record. It was too blunt. And here I am because I'm hearing my music, you know, and I'm like, and I'm expecting this feeling. And he came in with something, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could just change the first couple of lines, but I, I listen. They a couple of times people sample. Sometimes, sometimes it's a record about my father and him passing away. Yeah, yeah, and that's so all. So when when, yeah. when 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 people come on there and then they they joyful about this record. Yeah, they like, they're, they're like, like yo, what's up? I'm like I ain't, I ain't, that wasn't my intention. Yeah, like I cried this whole session laying this down. I had literally tears in it, yeah. and you taking this record and you making it over a, a happy way. I did, so so so, I, I I I don't like that sometimes. But uh, hold on, I got come on. And blurred lines, we we got through that, right? Yeah. Lost without you, you already answered that question. Without me, 
Uh, which one's without me? Sorry. No, no, I'm talking about without me asking okay. you because some of these. <laughs> well, I was like, I don't remember that stuff. <laughs> there were so many questions I was asking yeah, yeah, yeah. you. Uh, I, I have on my notes. You already answered earlier. Yeah, we got a good Lost Without You story. Yes. And you have you have a passion for Latin music, I hear. Oh yeah, I mean, I actually listen to uh, you know salsa and bossa nova when I when I exercise or when I'm relaxing. Like those, maybe it's because I don't understand all the words too, <laughs> right. and the mu the music is so good uh, that I, it takes me away and I don't focus on all the the words as much. Well, you know? what salsa artists do you like? That's oh, um, I like the the old school stuff, you know, uh, Cecilia Cruz, and I mean, I, I just have like the Apple playlists, and I just it's. it's right. It's just a great backdrop for me to... But I have... Uh, Luis Bonfa is one of my favorites. He's one of the uh, originators of uh, uh, Brazilian uh, guitar. Like, yeah. he came before Joe Beam. So once I got into Joe Beam, then I got into Luis Bonfa, and he has uh, a playlist that's just incredible. And I love the uh, Buena Vista Social Club. It's one of yeah, my yeah. albums, yeah. And you said Celia or Cuba, you know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you want Cuba? So this is something I've been wondering this whole time. You came in with your shirt off. Oh, why? But yo, your chest is red. My chest, but your face is not. I'm Irish. What the hell is going on? <laughs> is it red? Yeah, a little red. Okay. It's, it's because uh, I've, I've been playing tennis and shit. Oh, you know? okay. <laughs> Are you, are you taking your shirt off playing tennis? Is that what's I, going I, on? I, no, I was in Cabo, and that's what oh, I was. I took, okay, wifey, okay. I, took, okay. I took wifey to Cabo last week, okay. and we got four days, and I got burnt. Okay, okay. She got yeah. burnt, too, so yeah, it, was a, yeah. it was a team burnt. Okay, team burnt. <laughs> are we making noise for team burns? Team burns. Team burns. <laughs> Hey, you know, a family, a family that burns together stays together. Yes, you know? yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so what, 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 I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, man. Just to, to see you in person and to see, like, like your story is amazing, man. Like, you know, the stuff that you've been through in life, the stuff that you navigated through life, even when you say, like, your sad days to, 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 to recovering, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing life to me. Like, I, I'm sitting back saying, whoa, but is there something that you feel like you didn't do yet? Oh. You know, I would have liked, uh, I would have liked my dad to have been around with the grandkids more. Mm. Yeah. To see the grandkids. Yeah, I think when I think of myself, I've already had so much, and I still feel like at this moment I have so much. I'm so grateful. And I have this great theory that you can't simultaneously be grateful and feel anything negative at the same time. It's impossible. You can't do it. If you're grateful, you can't feel envy. You can't feel jealousy. You can't feel rage because wow. you're grateful. The only thing you can be is gluttonous. <laughs> That's facts. <laughs> So I try to make sure my, uh, I, I put my gratitude forward most of my day. I, I get anxious in the mornings. I worry about all my kids and their future. I have trouble sleeping. Um, I worry about the day, the week, the bills, you know, uh, paying for private school for the next 15 years for four kids or whatever. All these things make it hard to wake up, you right. know, or make it hard to sleep. sleep. Right. But then I just, before I even get out of bed, thank you, thank you. I'm so That they're grateful. healthy. And I you got them make here. Living. I'm right. getting out of bed. I'm still here, you know, because the things that I, I, that I had, like my dad and Andre Harrell, that my go-tos are gone, you know? Right. So my and no- And manager too. And my managers, so my new go-tos are, are my, my kids and my lady and the friends I got. And and then it's just being grateful for those people that are still here, that I get them, you know, and right. I got them. Is there anybody you ever tried to work with that didn't want to work with you? I'm sure, but you know, I've always probably, I, I, I believe that I, that's why I've never asked for help. It's, and maybe it comes from my dad not helping me right from the jump, like when I needed that grant. And he, he taught did, you that lesson quick. And he was like, yeah, don't need, don't need everybody. Uh, you know, he always told me, if I was writing a good song, he said, now you need to learn how to produce. And if I was yeah. producing, he said, now you should learn how to play guitar. If I was learning guitar, he said, now you should learn how to do Be harmony. Resourceful. He was always trying to make sure that I had enough resources, because he went through the same experience. He had some ups and downs in his career, and when they when he, they, he had a an L took an L on one of his shows or whatever he almost got canceled you know from the whole system right. and people turned their backs on him and this and that so he was like I'm never gonna let that happen again I'm gonna I'm gonna take every job I'm gonna make sure I have everything lined up so they can't kick me out or make me feel like I was kicked out you know I saw an interview um, 
that uh, ETV posted it, but it's an old interview with you and him, I think, on the set. Of, yeah, yeah. And um, he looked, he just seems so proud of you. Yeah, and he, was, he, he was, he, it's funny how he was always trying to get me to be better and do better, and that, that's what I remember, but then you hear how much he was telling all of his friends, all his friends tell me now, oh, your dad was always talking about you, always bragging about you, right. always, you know, and that's how, uh, that's how our parents are, you know, they yeah. challenge us, but they're usually out there bragging about us <laughs> the whole time also. So I'm not gonna lie, it seems like, because they say Jamaicans got the most jobs. Yeah. Who's they? Uh, yeah. <laughs> My dad was definitely Jamaican. Your My dad? dad was definitely. <laughs> Pop was definitely part Jamaican. <laughs> Boom, <buckle up. laughs> so now let me ask you. Um, you know me. I, I've been making music since 1997. I've been all over. All over. I've been places, and it's always like certain fans that come up to me that look nothing like me, grew up nothing like me, and they'll come up to me and they'll be like, what's up, Nori? And they'll, like, they'll actually know my story. What's, what's one of the craziest stories a fan has ever came up to you and just, like, and just, like, just talk to you and just, like, and you're like, you look, you, look, you like me? Oh, you mean like um, like somebody that I really admire? Right. Like old people always fuck me no, up. No, he's saying like, a regular fan, right? Oh, yeah, like regular a regular fan. fan. Yeah, regular oh, fan. Oh. Yeah. What's the crazy interaction with a yeah. regular fan? Oh, man, I wouldn't even know. A... Yeah, your life is too dope. We had, no, it's just... <laughs> It's, no, it's just like, okay. no, no, because it's, it's been fun, the different age groups, like, uh, you know, first of all, 90% of my audience is, is, is black women. Black women. Like, you come to my show, there's, there's a few scattered, peppered in. You like Gary Owens. You know, know what I mean? Fuck up. Let's go. Like, yeah, yeah it's <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't get a, and so, like, if I walk through the airport, let's say uh, 20, 30% white people recognize me, 90% yeah. black people would recognize me. You know God, what I mean? Yeah. It, that's how, for me, and that's, that, and even if I make eye contact, even if I walk by somebody, I'm like, well, you know what I mean? Right, like, right. We know each other, you right, know what I mean? Right. So, and, <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the beauty, of, and that's what I mean is that I'm not, I, that is my brother. That right. is, that's, these are, this is my culture, these are my fans, this is, these are my, my godfather, my mentor, right. Right. And, my, and my ex-wife. Right. But you know what I mean? There's nothing in my life that hasn't been me being a part or wanting to be uh, embraced and appreciate black culture, you know? And, and so that when I, I walk it, I live it, and that's why I think it's possible for all of us to walk and live with that kind of harmony, you know? God damn, I love that so much. I tell you the truth, you know, that's, that's one of my friends over there, that's um, my friend Diego, and I use his white privilege. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just being honest. Like, if we, we go outside, we jogging, I'm like, Diego, go in the front. They ain't, they ain't gonna hit you in the car. <laughs> And they'll, they'll go around this motherfucker. Like, yeah, we we outside at nighttime. They'll go around him. And I and, and listen, no, I, I I said this story on Dream Chance before, but I remember this. I was probably still at the highlight of my rap career, whatever, right? Still rapping. We're in Amsterdam at a bar. Already sounds good. It, it actually gets me a little wicked though. <laughs> so. <laughs> I walk out. I'm the platinum artist. I'm the guy who got us all here. We we here. I walk out. They stop me. They say, you can't bring that beer outside, sir. I say, all right, cool, no problem. <coughs> I go to smoke a cigarette. I smoke a cigarette at the time. Diego clearly picked up both of the beers and then walked right out. <laughs> and we did that six times. Oh, the no. whole night. And every single time. The man stopped me in Amsterdam? Crazy. and let him. Sir, you, can drink out here. you cannot drink out here. And and I could have easily been like, listen, listen. Oh I yeah, know who I, am. I know. I you know, you, yeah. you, you had a moment where you're like, you know who the fuck I yeah. am. Yeah. Like I could have easily been like, you know who the fuck. And I was just like, you know what? I still win. My beer is still outside. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. You, you think? Yeah. You think you did something? Yeah. You think I you still get my beer outside? And, and, I, yeah, and I swear to God, so. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> no, that's, that's that's real. Like me thinking about it to this day, it still actually hits me. It hits me because you know what? I grew up, I grew up in Queens, mm -hmm. and in Queens, you literally cannot be racist. Mm. Let me tell you why: your neighbors are white, your other neighbors Filipino. Yep, 
Your other neighbor's Haitian. Melting pot. Your other neighbor is Russian. Yeah. Right. This is for Queens. We are the United Nations of everybody. Yeah. If you're Chinese, I literally would go home at night from, from where I live. I would smell Chinese food, Russian food, Haitian food, Filipino food. Of course, Puerto Rican food. I'm half Puerto Rican. And then soul food, god damn it. Oh, Jamaican food. I, I, was, I was outside eating Jamaican food already. I was outside already eating Jamaican food. But literally, literally you can't be racist. So is that something that you had to ever navigate through? Like, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm playing around with my, my, my white friend, like yeah. saying that. But it's, it's something that literally we do use sometimes at, at certain points. Uh, uh, I do use them. I do. I, I say, yo, Diego, you go. I know this. Yeah. I know this. They won't is stop this, you. Is that something you haven't had to go through for your for, for one of your friends? For, because clearly you have friends? black friends, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, I just, uh, oh, I do remember a, a scenario, yeah, when I was with, I was about uh, 14, and I was with my singing group buddies, mm -hmm. and they had a girl at a mall out in, you know, an hour out of town or something who had to hook up on a discount of some clothes or something, right? So we were going to go raid the store and get the 50% discount and blah, 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 right? So I lit I'm in my uh, basketball uniform from my prep school. It even says Montclair Prep on it. Wow. And uh, we, we run in, we, we come out to the store with some clothes, we get in the car, and the two police cars show up. It's, you know, maybe they're just wow. closing hours, right? Cops pull me, it's me and my three, and my singing buddies, my, my singing group. Uh, my three black friends, and they pull me out of the car and ask me, and pull me aside and ask me if uh, I was safe and if they, I had been kidnapped and if what I, the I fuck? mean, uh, what the fuck? Literally, these are this is these, they brought me here to get free clothes. These are my boy. They teaching me how to say. Wow. And I was so offended. And then that's when the white offended gets it. That's when the Karen kicks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How dare you? <laughs> These are my friends. I'm calling my mother right now. I'm calling my mother in Sherman Oaks, and I want you to get on the phone with her. That's when the white boy kicks in. And we have an attorney. I I, I know two attorneys. <laughs> I'll what? see you at Costa Mesa court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that, that shit is real. And the thing is, is that, you know, we just, it, it's out there, man. And that's why we love the big cities, because at least more influence, more information, more cultural differences, more, more, more. And I have this theory that whatever a family does, if a, a patriarch or a matriarch, or, they just don't want this in their family, whatever it is. I just right. don't want that. I'm not going to have that in this house. Right. I'm not going to have that. It always shows up. Of course. Well, it always shows up. What everything, whatever you, whatever you, your grandfather was afraid, never wanted to happen in this family. Oh, it's, it's in the kitchen now. It's making. Right. So it's you count making on that, right? <laughs> you count on that. Yeah, it's making dinner. <laughs> and that, I think that's the beauty of, of, that's the work of God in some ways. Is right. you know, we right. need to keep, if your mind is that closed and your family's not moving forward and you're not opening your heart and your mind and your spirit, then something is going to force you to open it or close it forever. Right. But something's going to happen in your family or your life that's going to open you to force your heart. So let me ask you. I mean, force yeah. you to open your heart. <laughs> right. let me go. This is probably the one, like, serious, serious question I'm going to ask. Right. Um, like I said, with the story with my friend, like um, literally I had the best idea. I was like, I'm not going to let this guy ruin my vacation or ruin the where I'm at doing. Right. But at that same time, you know, um, there's black children that's getting killed every single day by the hands of the police. And you have mixed children. And I, I remember one of the illest stories I ever heard was Steve Rifkin telling me I, we was at Wally's, you know, Wally's in um, yeah. Beverly Hills. And Steve Rifkin telling me literally, because he has, he has kids, well, some, one, one of his kids look white and then the two others look black. And how his kids would leave his house and the black kids would get pulled over. <laughs> That look, but they both, they both, they all three was his yeah. kids. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing how I'm, I'm saying the story, but what I'm saying is, is that something? I'm sorry, this is, a, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a serious question, but it, I mean, um, it's, it's something that I think about all the time. Yeah, is 
Is that something that you worry about? I don't. My, my, my kids are pretty fair. Okay. Um, and, and because I grew up with all of these being pulled over experiences, that wasn't the right. only time right. that my friends were pulled over. Right. We, were, we would be on, on our way to, uh, my father had a place out in Santa Barbara, uh, and I'd be driving with my friends, and we'd just get pulled over and have to get searched out, you know what I mean? Now, luckily, none of them smoked. This is before I ever smoked weed, and right, they were right. singers. Right, so right, they right. didn't smoke weed, but we'd get pulled over just for being black, for most of us. Right, <laughs> being black. Right, right, right. So then I started being, man, we got pulled over for being black. <laughs> what, what's wrong with this kid? Somebody slap him. Somebody slap this white boy. Please. What is wrong with this young man? Right. But yeah, no, I grew up, because I was always around the culture and, 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 all my, and most of my friends uh, were black that yeah I, I experienced it all the time and I would be the first I, I remember fighting my extended family my dad was very open minded and my dad wrote jokes with Richard Pryor you know right. my dad managed Felipe wrote Win jokes with Richard yeah Pryor? he worked one of the early he would sit and he always bragged about it he said you know I would just uh, I, I could get him going and say hey Mudbone what did you do with that girl last night oh let me and then Richard would go on his rants and but they would have these writing sessions and um, so crazy. my dad always uh, felt felt like he was a, a white uh, man in the midst of, you know, black culture in some ways, and I respected his open-mindedness. And my mom saying, uh, you know, had her hit with a black man. So I literally come from an open-minded Hollywood hippie, you know, type family. Uh, so that gave me the right perspective to, to grow into that world. Man, that's a dope answer I ever heard. <laughs> Nah, nah, because, I, 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 like, like, you know, I, I got just like, I don't know, I'm somewhat of a therapist, right? <laughs> Fuck this. You saying you're somewhat of a therapist? Or a comedian, we're, we're finding Listen. out. <laughs> or, or, or a stand-up. Clear, or a stand-up comedian. Clear, clearly I didn't make the right choice in Friends. <laughs> clearly. How did they just laugh? <laughs> <laughs> How did they just laugh? No, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is I assess people. I have to, like, and what I'm trying to say is, man, like, I, I, like we went through your discography. I have never seen, like, so much stories just keep popping up. And it's like, wow. How are you, in, how are you not insane? How are you not Britney Spears halfway <laughs> your, hair, your hair cut off and went insane one weekend. You know what? I gotta say, uh, good woman. This good thing, woman will do that for he, you. He is correct. Good woman. I'm going good home man. tonight myself, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good woman, you know, she'll just, she'll make you think the right way and, and make you clean up what you need to clean up and make you respect what needs to be respected and and uh, and if you love that woman enough, you'll you'll get it right. Okay, so um, I mean, that's my next lyric. Can we? Can you guys send me that? Yes, yes, yeah, right now. We got you. I'm gonna I'm turn that into falsetto. <laughs> I'm gonna turn that into something falsetto right li there. Listening to the album, and I want you. I want you. Please don't cut that part out. No, no, no. We got you. No, no, no. That part is. The, I want points when I get home. But, but, but I want to ask you as as a, and I and I met Paula before. I yeah. met her um, with Sha Kim. Yeah. Oh, love Sha. Uh, Sha Kim. Sha love Sha. Uh, damn, I don't even know because I, I can still go out there. Well, I can say it. Soho House in Malibu. Mm -hmm. Met her. Probably one of the sweetest women I ever met. Everyone say one man garbage is the next man's trash or whatever. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, to me from the outside looking in. Yeah. One main percent look, like, look like the perfect woman. Did you mess that up, or, you know, that's that's one of those things. No, 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 because we already went over this. It was okay. It, there's a growth. There's a thing that goes apart. I mean, mm. and what you you know, what you see is not always what's going on at home. You know what I mean? And and um, I get a blunt. Yeah, and I think that. There was so there was endless love and uh, partnership and creativity, but also two careers that were spending six to eight months away from each other. Wow, baby, going back and forth. Wow, we're not. She's working twelve-hour days. I'm working twelve-hour days. We're in different cities. We didn't see each other for six months of the year, for a few wow. years in a row, even more maybe. 
And that, that takes a toll, you know? It just naturally, it takes a toll. And you, and I think it doesn't matter how much love and respect you have, the time, sometimes time apart, you know, breeds uh, two different apart, lives, right. two different lifestyles, two different lives, two different thought pr processes, you know? Right. And I, th I just think we had it all and, and we grew apart is the, is the nicest way to put it. Man, I'm taking a shot for you. Can I get a <laughs> Not for that though. Not for growing I, I, apart. No, I mean, I, I'm just saying. Um, and I don't. And I, honestly, in hindsight, it was the be it was it was the right thing. Like, I, I there's no regret there if that's what you're asking. What I'm yeah. You know what's the best thing about it is, regardless, if it was right, wrong, in between, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a messy breakup to us mm. from the outside looking yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, I looked at it like it was amicable. Well, you must have missed a few stories. <laughs> oh, he is your trying. therapist now. Oh, yeah, I told you I'm your therapist, my brother. I got you. I got you. I got you, my brother. I got you. I was trying to change the narrative. No, 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 no. Honestly, no. They, 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 we're, we're way past all that. Her yeah. and I are, are excellent co-parents. She's right. an amazing mother. Um, and I, I got, you know what, the, you, there's luck in picking uh, or being able to start a family with a woman right. uh, of that quality. Right. I know that my son has a great influence for the rest of his life. Wow. Uh, she has a great mother. She's a great mother. Uh, so there's only positive things have come out from that sense. God damn, it, man. God damn. It. He answered everything exactly no, how it's supposed to be. But like, in I a really good way. That way. That's, that's real. I really feel that way. That's real. Can I get a shot? I got a shot. And what matters is what, how your son comes out of and it. And one how thing that we, that we can say, I, at the time, she didn't want to have any more kids, and I wanted to have many. Right. And that's, a, that's an important factor in a relationship. Yeah. You trying to be Nick Cannon out here? No, I want <laughs> Not with different women, necessarily. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, Nick Cannon out here. I don't know what's going on. You know, I just, this is my friend. I, I, I cannot defend Nick. you at this point. You are out here busting in everything. I love Nick. You need to he, wrap it up. He's a Look, he's my friend. He's my he friend. He turned it into a TV show. Yeah, so at least I, he sees the, the... What I love about Nick is there's he's got this bulletproof, uh, you know, sense about himself. Like, he's just... He's one of the most hardworking, devoted, dedicated... Yeah, he's solid. Dedicated. He's a solid dude. And he's a great dude. one of the most helpful to his community, to everyone around him. Like, he is just as solid upon solid. Yeah. So we all are laughing and enjoying this. But, you know, him and I have had a serious conversation. Like, I, I am devoted, have devoted my life to my four kids. You, get, you spread yourself in it when Jesus, you do have yeah. a big heart like him. And you are a I great human. I got two and I'm he tired. Got 44 I can't kids. imagine. Yeah, he's such a great guy. And, and you know, it's, it's hard to give all of that love that he has to everybody, you know. So we have spoken about that. But if anyone can do it, Nick Cannon can. Nick yeah, can do it. Can. Let's, let's take a shot to Nick shot can do to it. Shot anybody can do it. Oh, yeah. If anybody can do it, you can, Nick. God damn. God damn. Nick Cannon, whatever you Super at. Super Nick. Wrap it up. Super Nick. We love you. Dale que tu puedes. Dale que tu puedes. We do on it. Yo, I'm a one. <laughs> Man. I got, I got, I got, I got. Okay, I, I'm I still... need a smoke break. <laughs> you I ain't gonna lie. Take the picture. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, yeah, we, we can wrap it up. Okay, okay. We, we spoke about love at the wall? No, we, I'm, I'm good. I think as, as long as. Oh, it's okay. As long as he takes a smoke break. That's a fact. Yeah, I, I had this uh, Yugoslavian I, billionaire uh, fly me out to the Jesus. south of south of Spain to Marbella, right, uh -huh. to work on his daughter's album. She was like 14 years old, and um, and that was the first time I ever smoked hash. <laughs> <laughs> hash is fantastic. It sounds like a lot was going on. By the way, you know you still owe, listen. You still owe me. You got to smoke. Don't. No, no, One, no. You got to smoke. I, I know you, math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know math, my friend. I know math too. And I know what I and agreed, agreed to. You agree? Don't, don't change this shit now. I didn't change it. I know math. The math is it's, it's getting All there, right. but it's not quite there yet. <laughs> All right. uh, yeah. That was some good hash. We, we, made a, we made a bet. I'll tell you about it later. Okay. <laughs> but uh, what's your, what's your, what's, what, what do you like more, making the record or performing the record? Oh, they both have their joys. The the oh, feel so taking a shot for this. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Just, even, I, oh, no, no, oh, no, no. Even though, oh, I even didn't realize we were doing it. Quick oh, time slime. No, we're not doing it, but we're doing it. Say, oh, no, no, you know, yeah, if okay, okay. Say both, can, can, okay, hold Jamie, on. Jamie, can we get another yeah, shot, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely yeah, yeah, need please. to explain why both. Yeah, please explain well, why. Well, the the creation of the record is um, a connection to God. It's something that is between me and God. The moment I'm at the piano. Something's happening. The feeling comes through you. The words start to come ether. through you. You know you're connected to something that's 
larger than you in some way because right. it's going to become larger than you. Somebody else will hear it. Someone else will feel it because you know it's that good. Right. I don't feel that way about most songs. I do feel that way every once in a while. I'm writing a song and I know what I'm writing and I know that it's, it means that much to me. And if it means that much to me, it's going to mean that much to someone, someone else. Yeah, someone else. And so when it's pure that way, that's your moment with God as you flow. The, 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 the feeling of being on stage is the feeling of community, of state, of family, of friendship, of connection. It's the, it's the moment where you are connected to the rest of the world. But the creation is, goes straight up. Mm. The performance goes straight out mm. and comes back. You know what I mean? I gotta take a that was the Cheers. deepest shit ever. By the way, you're probably the only guest that's worth both. That you are you are, you are you are drinking and getting deeper. <laughs> Most you're getting like, more, I'm, you're I'm, more by profound. the way, I'm trying to trick you and it's not working. Well, the thing <laughs> I spend a lot of time working on myself for better or worse, and that's mm -hmm. what that's what the evolution of Robin Thicke and a lot. And he, my last album was called On Earth and in Heaven, because it was about the people. It was about losing Andre and my dad, the people that are in heaven and the people that are still here. So I'm constantly working on my place in this world, my place in my family, my place within myself. And that self-analyzation sometimes makes you get stuck. Mm. You know what I mean? You have to remind yourself to get out of it because maybe you're doing too much inner work that you're not uh, present with the people that are right there in front of you. So as an artist, I can sometimes be walking around and creating and working, but not being present enough. So I try to balance the two. Because well, well, um, as, as I'm hearing you talk, it just sounds like you work, 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 work. What does a vacation feel like to Even you? Even when I'm on vacation, I got my headphones yeah. and my lyric pad. You know what I mean? Because that, that means, because it, it doesn't, it just doesn't come enough. It doesn't come as much as it used to. Right. I don't have as much time. And I don't, I don't have as much space for creativity. Thank you. So I try to remind myself to be ready for that lightning bolt because that when that lightning bolt comes, it usually I usually write the song in five to ten minutes, and the all the other ones take hours and hours and hours. Mm. But those lightning bolts that are pure, and they might not even come for two years. <laughs> it might take two years to have a lightning uh, bolt, and then you get five in a row. You know what I mean? So I think you just as an artist. You can also excuse yourself mm. in the presence of others by saying you're creating. Right. <laughs> so it becomes a... Has it become an excuse ever? It can at times. It can, it can be a way to, to create some separation or space when I need it. Because I, I really do wake up every day trying to give to either give to the art, give to the family, give to your... Give to just give more than you ask for. You know what I mean? And, and then you end up receiving a lot because you're giving more than you're asking for. I know you gotta leave, so let me ask you. They say great artists have to go through pain. Is that something you feel like you have to go through in order for you to make great music? You have to go through. Yeah, I think that. It, Are you because, a masochist? Because in that way? Uh, you know what we talked about this earlier. I think that I, I don't mind swimming in it, because I know that I'm I'm swimming in it for a purpose, for an end game. I'm mm -hmm. swimming in it to make something from it that will make me feel better and will make others feel better. And because I've 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 gotten to have that connection with the evolution, the that album was so personal. Every lyric on that album was me literally trying to find myself, get through the fact that I had a failed album and a, and uh, and everything that I that everyone told me was going to happen didn't happen. We had this whole peak that was supposed to be Ivy and Andre Harrell, Puff Daddy, Naomi Campbell's at the party. Here comes the album. Boom. You know what I mean? And then so two years later, I'm doing yoga. I'm, I'm <laughs> going through all, I'm doing therapy. I'm trying to figure, and all that evolution of Robin Thicke album was based on who am I if I'm not a star? Who am I if I'm not famous? Who can I love myself if I don't make it? And that, that's why that album ended up uh, resonating with a lot of people, because who are you if you're not important? Now, I related to that so much. Let me just say, tell you something. I had an album called Melvin Flint, The Hustlers. It's my first album, and I feel like Pharrell had like the most part. Like He did like seven records. Every other album, we probably did one or, or two. Melvin Flint, The Hustler came out, did three and a half mics in the sauce. Mm. If you don't get four mics, you don't go gold. Mm. You don't go platinum. 
or I've went into a state of depression. It's like, it's like the third time I heard you say, I had an album that didn't work. And it was a great album, by the way. I had an album that didn't work, which was from the Hustler, but guess what? It worked later. Mm. Do you feel like the people were wrong, or do you feel like you were wrong? Well, no, I think that uh, I think that some things are too soon. Some things are, you know, before their time. And and that's what the beauty of art is that a, a great movie and a great a, a, one of your songs will end up on a thing and it'll yep. and then it gets another life for him. And then, right. and 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 it's only supposed to be appreciated by those that a re that it reaches, you know. And we can't reach everybody all the time. I'm sorry, I'm taking another shot. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you got me riled up. It's like, good. I don't know what the fuck's going on. You got you and I. You can, who are you sorry cause, to? Cause, no, I'm just being honest. Because I heard, I heard him saying that, and he said it three times, or maybe even more than three times. You're like, yo, I had an artist. It, and the thing is, we still got to come outside. When you have something that, it, to the people's perception, they said it, it, it didn't come out, it didn't come. We still got to come outside, and we still got to smile. Yeah. We still have to smile. Thank it's you. not, it's, it's being uh, entertained or famous, you oh, went too fast. Oh, well, you doing it. Uh, <laughs> I thought being, you did yours. Yeah, I got it. So I appreciate you being so honest and being so humble about it, saying saying that because we still got to be who we are, and, and these people thought that we had a failure moment, right? Right. So the fact that you kept saying that all night, one, you're not avoiding it, you're saying it straight up, and then two, did this like because because my album like that people thought failed oh, eventually went eventually went platinum. I love this. Yeah. It eventually went platinum. Yeah. So. This moment, you're setting me up perfectly. We're talking about my first album. I believe my first album is my greatest artistic achievement. Wow. Did you believe it then, though? And I did then, and we okay. all did. Okay. Yeah, and I okay. still do. And, and the fans and the friends and the, and the peers, the fact that before Evolution, before Lost Without You, that Usher, Jay-Z, Pharrell, Naomi, Seal, Puff, like Puff Dad, they were all saying, you're, this is great. This music is great. So that, that was enough for me at the time. Then, because Jimmy spent so much money and it didn't hit, I was all scared. I had to go to the drawing board. I wrote all these. Then I just had this piano, and it was just me at the piano just drilling these songs one after the other. And then something magical happened, you know? Let me ask you, though. Did those same peers that told you it was a great album, did they change when the sales didn't reflect that? No, no. The, all the, Because they didn't need to. Like, it's always, it's always the B-level people that are wishy-washy and you know usually the people who are that great they have so much confidence in themselves because they should right. that they can appreciate your greatness too jay-z right. can jay-z knows he's great they didn't so need he to be affirmed go, by oh, the sales right. that song's great too yeah, song's right because i'm pretty great <laughs> yes, yes. yes you are oh, yes, yes, you are. <laughs> But, but so I, 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 I've, I've learned that, that the, the more the people accomplish and really truly have genuine confidence in themselves, they're okay telling you that you're great also. We've told, I've told Nori plenty of times with Mo and Flint that, and a lot of people have told you, we all thought it was an amazing album. He always was like, this is my worst album, only because you created it in a... I believe the fan. No, right. no, no. Right. No, right. no, that's not what right. happened. You, you created that album in a, in, a, in, a, in a difficult time for your life. Yes, it was right after my father, my father died. father passed, because oh, I was around when he... I should have said that. I was right after my father died. They had gave me all this money, and right. they told me, you still got to perform. Yeah. And I... I, I You're just I, carrying I, all I wasn't this. there. Yeah. Like, yeah. When I was in the studio, I wasn't there. I was thinking about, like, why the fuck does this happen? You know, I remember... I don't want to... Yeah, going a little no, crazy. No, no, please, but man. We're asking I, that as no, a guest. We let's do it. We'll do a part two. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I remember my father. But, 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 let me say that. But, um, yeah, me hearing you say that, I, would, I, I identify with you so much because, one, I could tell you still came outside. Well, you know what happened was the beauty of it, was, and that's what Andre was teaching me at the time, was I, I just wanted to paint mm. when I made the first album. Mm -hmm. I just, I had so many ideas, so many desires, and I wanted to be different from anyone who had ever existed, mm -hmm. period. I wanted to be the only me that ever happened. And that's what that album was about. The second album was about, I didn't connect somehow. How do I connect? Mm -hmm. How do I tell a more personal story that will connect with people personally? Because the first album was sonically... You know, all, in my opinion, sonically impressive production, uh, but the, so the lyrics on the second album, 
mm-hmm. is why is the lost without you, the complicated, the angels, the to the sky, cocaine, you know, got to be down. Lyric after lyric of I'm trying to connect with you. And I reached out and I opened my arms and I wanted everybody to hug me back. And that's what that album was. Well, let me just tell you something. <laughs> this was a pleasure. I really, I really, I really had my expectations up here, but you just brung it through the roof, around the corner. We're on a fire hydrant somewhere oh, with those shoes what on. What a compliment. I'm just being honest thank with you. you. you and you did, guys, you guys are the best at this, so that's oh, a very you, nice compliment. No, but you did above and beyond. Your story is so beautiful, and you got to continue telling it. Because I'm just saying, this shit is great. Well, this is the most stories I've ever told in one place. And we need part two still. And you know what? Because I, 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 I've seen this, I've seen you guys, and I see right. the way you talk, and I see how real it is, and I know your story. Yeah. I'm a fan of yours. Thank you. And, and what you're doing now, and, right. and just being real and being yourself on a daily and letting people into your world and your heart as a big, tough man right. who's, you know, right, right, right. from the hip-hop right. game, yep. and you're sharing your heart and your world. And so I felt safe here, and I felt like, you know, this was a place where I could tell these no, stories. No, I ain't man. gonna lie. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, thank you. Le- no, no, I face to face, man to man, let me just be honest with you. You really opened up. You really, you really didn't hold back on nothing, and that's really dope because you are... A rock star. Oh, you're thanks, a sir. superstar. Take that, you're, honey. You're royalty. You take that, you're honey. Royalty. No, you said I'm a rock star. You're a royalty. I'm going to get points. I'm going to get points at home for this. And, and we respect the shit out of you. Let's take a fuck with you, baby. Yes, love.